Hey guys, in this week's video, we'll be going over um, the May 2019 SAT QAS. So here we're starting off with the reading section and we have the literature passage here. This passage is adapted from Colm Toibin, the master. This novel is based on the life of writer Henry James. On one of his strolls in Rye, Henry stopped at the door of Mr. Milson, who after the first meeting greeting, greeted him instantly as Mr. James and knew him as the American writer. Having his walk in a rye, he was slowly growing to admire and love. Okay, so even though he's a foreigner, he's starting to love this place that he's visiting. Upon his second or third conversation with Mr. Milson during his time as a resident of Point Hill, he observed that he longed for a permanent spot in the area in the countryside, or indeed in the town itself. Since Mr. Milson enjoyed talking, and since he was not interested in literary matters, and since he had not been in, to America and knew no other Americans, and since Henry's knowledge of ironmongery was rudimentary, the two men discussed houses, ones which had been put up for rent in the past, others which had uh, been put on the market or sold or withdrawn, and others much coveted which had never been bought or sold or rented in living memory. So here in the first paragraph we see that these two men, Henry and Mr. Milson, don't really have a lot of talking points. Um, you know, Mr. Milson isn't interested in literature. He's not American. He hasn't been to America. Henry doesn't know anything about ironmongery. So they decide that their common talking point is going to be this um, talking point of houses because Henry himself wants to move into the area. Each time he visited, once they had initiated their subject, Mr. Milson showed him the card on which Henry's London address was inscribed. He had not mislaid it. He had not forgotten, he insisted, and then enticingly would mention some great old house, perfect for a bachelor's needs, but sorrowfully would have to admit that the house remained firmly in its owner's hands and seemed unlikely to leave them in the foreseeable future. So every time they sort of talk about um, houses and houses in the right area, uh, Mr. Milson always points out, oh, there's a really nice house maybe down the street that you would like, but unfortunately, you know, um, no one's going to sell it anytime soon. Henry viewed his conversations with Mr. Milson as a form of play, just as his conversations with fishermen about the sea or with farmers about the harvest were forms of polite relaxation, a way of drinking in England, allowing its flavors to come to him in phrases, turns of speech, and local references. So this is how um, Henry sort of thinks about his conversations with Mr. Milson. He thinks of them as a way to relax, a way of allowing its England's flavors to come in, allow him to, you know, sort of explore and get a taste of the culture in England and how the locals talk and how um, sort of the locals, you know, interact with each other. Thus, even when he opened the letter which arrived at his London address, having noticed that the handwriting on the envelope was not that of someone accustomed to writing letters, and even when he saw the name Milson as the sender, he was still puzzled by its provenance. Only when he read it a second time did he realize who it was from and then, as though he had received a blow in the stomach, he understood what the letter said. So he gets this letter from um, Mr. Milson. And at first, he's puzzled and he's kind of uh, doesn't understand it, but only when he reads it a second time um, does he so sort of understand what the letter entails. Lamb House and Rye had a fallen vacant, Milson told him, and could be had. So there's an opening in this house in Rye, and uh, maybe Henry can move in if he wants. His first thought was that he would lose it. The house at the quiet corner at the top of a cobbled hill whose garden room Edward Warren had drawn so lovingly. The establishment he had glanced at so achingly and covetously on his many tours of Rye. A house both modest and grand, both central and secluded. The sort of house which seemed to belong so comfortably and naturally to others and to be inhabited so warmly and fruitfully by them. So this is basically just saying that... Um, Henry has sort of always held this house in high regard. He's This house has always been sort of his dream house. He has so many good things to say about this house. He checked the postmark. He wondered if his ironmonger was freely broadcasting the news of his vacancy to all comers. So he wonders, is Mr. Milson talking about this vacancy in the house to everyone he talks to? Maybe if he talks to everyone, then maybe he'll be too late to sort of claim his spot in this house. 
this was more than any other the house he loved and longed for again this idea that this house is his dream house he could do what he liked he could send a cable he could take the next train but he remained sure that he would lose it so even though he sort of this is his dream house um and like sort of he longs to live in this house he's sort of attached to this house in a way um he's sort of still pessimistic um, he's still somewhat sure. He's like, oh, this has to be too good to be true. He remains sure that you know something's gonna go wrong down the road because, once again, um, there's no way. He's sort of skeptical that he, everything would just fall into place for him like this. There was no purchase, however, in thinking or regretting or worrying. There was only one solution, and that was to rush to Rye, thus ensuring that no omission on his part could cause him not to become the new inhabitant of Lamb House. So he's saying you know, to sort of give himself the best chances of moving into this dream house of his, his best option is just to, you know, rush there immediately to see um, what the situation's like. Before he wrote to Edward Warren, imploring him to come to Rye, also as soon as he could to inspect the inside of the house whose exterior he had so admired. But he could not wait for Warren, and he certainly could not work. And on the train, he wondered if anyone was watching him would know how momentous this journey was for him, how exciting and how potentially disappointing. So again, this idea of disappointment, this idea that he remains sure that he would lose this opportunity to live in this house, this pessimism that um, Henry has. He knew that it was merely a house. Others bought and sold houses and moved their belongings with ease and nonchalance. It struck him as he traveled towards Rye that no one save himself understood the meaning of this. Um, for so many years now, he had no country, no family, no establishment of his own, merely a flat in London where he worked. He did not have the necessary shell, um, and his exposure over the years have left him nervous and exhausted and fearful. It was th as though he lived a life which lacked a facade. Um, a stretch of frontage to protect him from the world. Lamb House would offer him beautiful old windows from which to view the outside. The outside, in turn, could peer in only at his invitation. So here, at sort of the last paragraph of the passage, as the passage closes, we really see why Henry sort of values this house, um, this Lamb House. And the reason being that sort of Throughout his life, over the past few years, he lived in this London flat where he hasn't had a lot of privacy. He hasn't had a shell where he could call home and sort of be vulnerable. Um, he's always been open to sort of the outside world. And this is what Lamb House provides to him. This is why he values it so much, because it's like a facade and it's like a shell um, for him from the outside world. Okay, so moving on to the questions now. Number one. Over the course of the passage, the main focus of the narrative shifts from A. A summary of the reasons for Henry's unhappiness in Rye to a description of his attempt to find happiness there. Um, so does it really summarize why Henry is unhappy in Rye in the beginning? No, it doesn't really. It really just talks about sort of um, his relationship with Mr. Henry and I mean, not his relationship with Mr. Henry, but rather his relationship with Mr. Milson and why he is searching for a house in Rye. He doesn't really talk about why he's unhappy in Rye. Uh, B, a depiction of life in the town of Rye. Okay, this is immediately wrong because we don't see a depiction of life in the town of Rye. We only see one individual really who lives in Rye and that's Mr. Milson. And we never see a depiction of his life. You know, we never really see, you know, what the community is like in Rye, what the architecture is like in Rye. We never see, you know, how the people live their lives in Rye. So B is automatically wrong. C, a contrast between Harry's person, uh, Henry's personality and Mr. Milson's, per okay. So automatically this is um, wrong. There is no contrast between Henry's personality and Mr. Milson's personality. They do talk about sort of how they have no talking points, but they don't talk, they don't you know, directly contrast in the passage, Henry's personality and Mr. Milson's personality. Um, I wouldn't say that's the main focus of the narrative. The main focus of the narrative, at least in the beginning part, is talking about how Henry would like to sort of move into this uh, area of Rye. So that just leaves D. So D should be the correct answer. And D is an account of Mr. Milson's search for a suitable property. Okay, again, at the beginning, we do see that. You know, he longed for a permanent spot in the area. He does, um, he is searching rather for a suitable property 
um, for Henry in this area. And in the end, does it shift to a portrait of Henry's mi uh, musings on the meaning of having a home? Um, does it shift to sort of what Henry values in a home? And if we look at the ending of the passage here, we see that the answer is yes. We do see why Henry values a home so much. It's because it gives him the necessary shell, it gives him a facade, and it gives him protection from the exposure that he doesn't have in his London apartment. So number one is going to be D. Number two, which choice best summarizes what is learned about Henry and Mr. Milson in the first paragraph of the passage? Um, so in the first paragraph of the passage, we really see that, um, you know, Henry stops by sometimes at Mr. Milson's house and they sort of talk and they don't really have a lot of talking points because once again, let's take a look at the passage. They say that um, Mr. Milson enjoyed talking and since he was not interested in literary matters, he had not been to America, he knows no other Americans, Henry doesn't know about ironmongery, um, they sort of have... A disconnect. They don't have a lot of good talking points. So what do they talk about? They talk about um, the houses in the area and how maybe there may be an opening for Henry to move in somehow. So the correct answer choice for number two is going to be B. They have little in common. Again, um, Mr. Henry has you know never lived in America before. Never, um, never sort of been to America before. Um, and, you know, Henry knows nothing about ironmongery, so they sort of just talk about houses that may be of interest to Henry, and sort of uh, Mr. Milson gives him some properties that are nice for people like Henry. So number two is going to be B. Number three, which choice most closely captures the literal meaning of the figurative flavors referred to in line 32? Okay, line 32. Um, Henry viewed his conversations with Mr. Milson as a form of play, just as his conversations with fishermen about the sea or with farmers about the harvest um, were forms of polite relaxation, a way of drinking in England, allowing its flavors to come to him in phrases, turns of speech, and local references. So a sort of flavor here doesn't mean like, you know, literally like a taste, like the flavor of the you know, food, but it's talking about the flavor, like the cultural flavor of England, sort of the cultural nuances, maybe um, the cultural tendencies, you know, how the locals talk, how the locals, um, you know, phrase their sentences, maybe how the locals drink and, you know, where the locals go. So in talking about flavors, he's really talking about um, what makes England unique, what gives England its character and its flavor. So number three is going to be C. Uh, again, the aspects of a place that give it its particular character, this particular character, this particular unique flavor, this unique character um, that is unique to this one place. Number four, the passage indicates that Henry has which reaction when he receives Mr. Milson's letter? The lines that we just highlighted here, only when he read it a second time did he realize who it was from, and then as though he received a blow in the stomach, he understood what the letter said. So only the second time he read it did he really understand sort of the significance and the impact of the letter. The first time he read the letter, um, he didn't really understand sort of its significance and its impact and how it related to him. So that's sort of going to be his first reaction um, upon reading the letter from Mr. Milson. So number four is going to be B. He initially fails to appreciate the letter's significance. Only when he read it a second time did he realize, you know, who it was from um, and what was in the letter for him. Okay, moving on to number five. The passage suggests that after reading and understanding Mr. Milson's letter, Henry, okay, so again, this number four, the previous question asked what sort of was his initial reaction maybe after reading it the first time but number five is asking for um, his reaction or um, his beliefs or maybe what he thinks after reading and understanding the letter so let's take a look at uh, the passage to see what it can tell us 
So we can see that he's sort of reading the letter here and he's sort of talking about um, why this house is good. And after he reads the letter, he checks the postmark. He wondered if this ironmonger was freely broadcasting the news of his vacancy to all comers. So right after reading the letter, he sort of begins to have doubts. He doubts that hmm, maybe uh, Mr. Milson is sort of advertising the vacancy in this property to, to sort of everyone that visits him. So he sort of doubts that. Um, he will, you know, get this house because he has this suspicion that Mr. Milson is advertising this vacancy to a lot of other people. So that's really the answer we should be looking for. And we see that the answer is going to be C. He suspects that Mr. Milson may not be looking out exclusively for his best interests. Um, again, this suspicion that Mr. Milson uh, might be advertising to the property to others other than himself. This shows that he may not only be looking out for um, Henry, but he may also be looking out for you know other possible tenants of the house, other possible buyers of the Lamb House. Okay, number six. Uh, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? Number five. So um, again, we look at the lines here he wondered if his ironmonger was freely broadcasting the news of his vacancy to all comers so again the sort of doubt that he may not be looking out exclusively for his best interests so number six is going to be c number seven it can be inferred that henry fears that he will lose the possibility of being able to live in lamb house because okay why does he fear that he might not be able to um sort of live in Lamb House. So let's see here. Where does he sort of talk about his doubts of um, living in Lamb House? He talks, he says here that this was more than any other the house he longed and lived for. This is sort of his dream. Nothing had ever come easily, magically like this. So he's sort of doubting it because sort of it, it's coming too easy. Everything is given to him on a silver platter. Nothing had ever come easily for him. Why is this coming so easily and so magically? He could do what he liked. He could send a cable. He could take the next train, but he remained sure that he would lose it. So again, this is the reason why he has doubts, why he remains sure that he would maybe lose this property. It's because nothing ever had come easily for him. Um, so if we take a look at the answer choices for number seven, the answer is going to be B. He cannot believe that a wish he feels so intensely could possibly be fulfilled. Again, this idea that this dream of his is too good to be true. The fact that he gets this house is too good to be true. The fact that nothing had ever come easily, magically like this, nothing had ever come easily to, uh, like this. Why would this house sort of just fall into his hands and, you know, come so easily like this? So he has doubts he cannot believe that sort of this wish would come so easily and that's why he believes that he's gonna lose it and he's not gonna be able to get the house number eight which choice best supports the claim that henry feels that his life has been characterized by a struggle to attain things that he desired so again i remember the lines nothing had ever come easily magically like this this shows again that he struggled to attain things that he desired because nothing had ever come easily nothing he had ever wanted had come easily and magically like the house did so number eight is going to be the lines that we just talked about choice a number nine the last paragraph mainly serves to okay so without looking at the answer choices um we can sort of see uh the values that henry has for this house, this lamb house in the last paragraph. Because once again, he talks about sort of why he values a house as opposed to his flat in London. Because the house gives him his shell, it gives him a protection from the exposure, it gives him a facade to hide behind. This is why he values a house. So I would say the last paragraph, its main purpose is to sort of um, provide a reasoning for Henry's dreams of having a house and to provide, um, you know, maybe a sort of context or an explanation as to why Henry loves the house on uh, in Rye so much, this lamb house, why he loves it so much. So number nine is gonna be B, to provide context that explains Henry's particular aspiration. What is Henry's particular aspiration? This aspiration is to uh, move into Rye, move into lamb house and uh, sort of get this facade. And it does provide context. It does tell um, us readers why he wants a house. It's because, once again, he wants a shell. He wants protection from exposure. He wants a facade. So with that said, number nine is going to be B. Number 10, the last question on this passage. The words shell 
exposure, facade, and frontage in lines 80 through 83 primarily serve to. So let's see. Shell, again. He did not have the necessary shell in his London apartment. Um, he had been exposed over the years that had left him nervous, exhausted, and fearful. It is though he lived a life which lacked a facade in this London flat. There was no privacy. Um, there was no sort of, you know, uh, good aspect of living in such a, uh, living in such a flat that there are in sort of living in land house and living in a house. So um, I would say that these words, shell, exposure, facade, frontage, and lines um, 80 through 83, they sort of um, identify um, places that the house provides with Henry. Um, Henry has certain needs. He wants a shell. He wants protection. He wants a facade. And um, these are the certain features of the house that make them so valuable to Henry, if that makes sense at all. So number nine, the answer choice, I mean, sorry, not number nine, but number 10 is uh, the answer choice is going to be A, to establish a parallel between aspects of Henry's personality and certain features of houses. So again, um, to choose this answer choice, to provide solid evidence for this answer choice, we need to see. Does it sort of um, does it satisfy both parts of the answer? Does it establish a parallel between aspects of Henry's personality? Well, it does because it does show that he's sort of um, introverted. It does show that he's sort of um, sort of homely and he sort of needs protection. It does draw a parallel between the fact that. Um, he has no country, no family, no establishment. And it does connect it to, again, the certain features of the house. And it does show how the house will provide for Henry by giving him the shell, by giving him protection from exposure, by giving him a facade to hide behind. So uh, that just gives evidence to A for number 10. And that wraps up this passage. Moving on to the second passage now. This passage and accompanying figure are adapted from World Development Report 2015, Mind, Society, and Behavior. 2015 by International Bank for Reconstruction and Development slash the World Bank. Behind every intervention lies an assumption about human motivation and behavior. When a tunnel providing water to the city of Bogota, Colombia, partially collapsed in 1997, triggering a water shortage, the city government declared a public emergency and initiated a communication program to warn inhabitants of the threat of a crisis. 70% of the city would be left without water if current water use was not reduced. The city's strategy was based on the assumption that if individuals were informed of the situation, they would adjust their behavior and reduce usage. After all, no one wants to be without water. But the assumption was wrong. In fact, the city's strategy increased water consumption. Many people did not change their behavior because they did not think they could make a difference and did not know which steps were most important. Some people even started to stockpile water. Recognizing the mistake in its assumptions, the city government changed its strategy. First, the government reminded people to take action by uh, conserving water at times when they were most likely to overuse it. Stickers featuring a picture of a statue of San Rafael, which was the name of the emergency reservoir the city was relying on after the tunnel collapse, were distributed throughout the city. People were asked to place a sticker by the faucet. Uh, that a particular household, office, or school used most frequently. The stickers made the need to conserve water at all times salient. Daily reports of the city's water consumption were prominently published in the country's major newspapers. The reports became a part of public discussions about the emergency. Second, the city government launched engaging and entertaining campaigns to teach individuals the most effective techniques for household water conservation. The campaigns contained memorable slogans and organized 4,000 youth volunteers to go throughout the city to inform people about the emergency and teach them effective strategies to reduce consumption. The mayor himself appeared in a TV ad taking a shower, explaining how the tap could be turned off while soaping. Third, the city government publicized information about who was cooperating and who was not. The chief executive officer of the water company personally awarded 
households with exceptional water savings, a poster of San Rafael, the legend. Here we follow a rational plan for using the precious liquid. These awards were made visible in the media. Three months later, when a second tunnel collapsed in the reservoir, the city imposed sanctions for uh, despilferadors, squanderers, those with the highest levels of overconsumption. While the sanctions were minor, squanderers had to participate in a water saving workshop and were subject to an extra day of water cuts. So here, um, the third strategy that the government sort of uses was the strategy of punishment and reward. You know, if people, if families used and conserved more water, they were given rewards, they were given this poster. If they used too much water or they weren't following the guidelines, then they were um, forced to, you know, take water cuts and participate in water saving workshops to change their behavior. Car washing businesses, although collectively not a major source of water waste, were the primary targets. The assumption underlying the new strategy was that conservation would improve if the city created a greater scope for social rewards and punishments that helped to reassure people that achieving the public good was likely. This time, the assumption was correct. The change in strategy helped to create a social norm of water conservation. By the eighth week of the campaign, citywide water savings had significantly exceeded even the most ob optimistic technical predictions. Moreover, the reductions in water use persisted long after the tunnel was repaired and the emergency had been addressed. And here we have a graph showing um, the change in time and also showing the change in water demand over time. Uh, so now that we've sort of read the passage and we sort of understood it, let's move on to the questions. Number 11, the main purpose of the passage is to, okay, so let's take a look at the passage and let's reflect on what we just read. So I would say the main purpose of the passage at the beginning, it was to talk about this sort of pressing problem that was uh, evident in the city of Bogota. The fact that um, there was a collapse of this tunnel and there was going to be a water shortage. That's the main problem. And we later go into the main focus shifts to um, the solution that the government tried to propose to solve this problem. At first, the government proposed an unsuccessful solution. They painted it as a crisis and this sort of backfired. But later on, they came up with, you know, these three um, new strategies and these strategies worked in reducing water consumption. So I would say the main purpose of the passage is to sort of talk about um, how the city of Bogota was able to better um, its water crisis and how it was able to uh, conserve more water. So the answer for number 11 is going to be D. Discuss an effective city initiative to address a critical situation. So what is this critical situation? Well, the critical situation is obviously the water crisis, the shortage of water in the city of Bogota. And what is the effective city initiative? Well, the effective city initiative, as talked about in the passage, is going to be the three methods that the city employed to uh, conserve water. The first one was um, conserving water and placing the stickers there. Second, the engaging and entertaining campaigns, you know, having the mayor appear on TV and take a shower. And the third was the system of reward and punishment. So that just gives evidence to D for number 11. Number 12, which choice best describes the overall structure of the passage? So we talked about this a little bit when we were going over number 11, and I said that the overall structure of the passage was they propose a problem at the beginning. In the first paragraph, they talk about the tunnel collapsing and sort of the impending water crisis. In the second paragraph, they talk, second and third paragraph rather, they talk about um, a solution that was initially proposed and why that solution maybe didn't work out like expected. And then later in the paragraph, they talk about a new proposal, a new set of solutions, a set of three methods that succeeded and why they succeeded in conserving water in the city of Bogota. So taking a look at the answer choices, um, the answer to number 12 is going to be A, a complex problem is described. So this complex problem, the problem of the water shortage, is just described in passage one. A failed attempt to resol resolve that problem is summarized. Okay, So the failed um, solution being that um, the city you know, painted this as a water crisis, saying that 70% of the city would be left without water. This was the uh, resolution to the problem that was that failed, that was unsuccessful. And then the details of a successful resolution are presented. So what is this successful revolution? Well, it was this, um, you know, three pronged solution. It was the um, stickers, it was the engaging and entertaining campaigns, and it was the system of reward and punishment. So a is going to be the correct answer for number 12. 
Number 13. Which choice best supports the claim that creative tactics were employed to encourage people to conserve water? Well, taking a look at this sort of second um, point here that they make, um, here we talk about you know, uh, memorable slogans, 4,000 youth volunteers. Um, here we see the mayor himself appeared in a TV ad taking a shower. That's something sort of engaging and creative, thinking out of the box um, sort of method that was used by the city to conserve water. So taking a look at if we can find some lines in this paragraph that are uh, present in the answer choices, we see that our answer choice is going to be uh, choice D, lines 40 through 42 through 44, basically the lines talking about um, the mayor uh, taking a shower. And this does show a creative tactic to, you know, show people how to conserve water and to show people that conserving water is important. Number 14, the passage implies that the city's first attempt to address the water so uh, shortage was inadequate in that it failed to. So why was the city's first attempt to, um, you know, educate people, educated citizens about the water so shortage? Why did it fail? Why was it bad? Um, so let's take a look. Um, so let's see. Um, so if we take a look at the first paragraph, this is really where they talk about sort of this first attempt to address water shortage and the solution to it. Um, it says here that the city strategy was based on the assumption that if individuals were informed of the situation, they would adjust their behavior and reduce usage. Um, but we later, you know, find out that this assumption is wrong. So, um, so we can deduce from this, um, from this that sort of the residents did not really know how to use did not really know how to react to this information. Later on, we see that many people did not change their behavior because they did not think they could make a difference and did not know which steps were most important. Um, they know that there's gonna be a water crisis, but they don't really know how to use this information. They don't know how to you know, take action and take charge and begin conservation. They only know how to stockpile and use more water. They don't really know the best steps to take in order to um, you know, prevent this crisis. So the answer to number 14 is going to be B. Um, the first city's first attempt to address the water shortage was inadequate because it failed to explain to residents how to uh, best use the new information. So they did explain the new information was that, you know, um, the city is going to maybe go into a water crisis if we don't reduce our water usage. This was the new information, but they didn't explain to residents how exactly to reduce their water usage. They didn't explain to residents how to prevent this water crisis. And this is the uncertainty that the residents go through. Many people did not th uh, change their behavior because they did not think they could make a difference. They did not know which steps were the most important. So that gives evidence to B for number 14. Number 15, as used in line 18, steps most nearly means. Um, okay, so line 18 is uh, here. Um, many people did not change their behavior because they did not think they could make a difference and did not know which steps were the most important. So steps here is like um, the steps to solving a solution, maybe which measures to take, which actions to make, um, sort of something along those lines in that context. So the correct answer for number 15 is going to be A, measures. Um, because again, let's plug in uh, the word into the sentence. Many people did not change their behavior because they did not think they could make a difference and did not know which measures were the most important. Again, which steps, which measures, which actions were most important uh, when it came to solving the problem. So 15 is A. 16. According to the passage, the purpose of the stickers distributed by the Bogota city government was to, so why did, what was the purpose of the stickers? So um, if we take a look at this uh, pass, I mean, not passage, but paragraph starting in line 20, we see where they talk about the sticker. And uh, really, if we take a look, uh, they say that the stickers were placed where uh, water was most commonly wasted, most commonly overused and people were asked to place a sticker here, and it sort of, um, the sticker here, it says the stickers made the need to conserve water at all times salient. So the sticker, um, the purpose was to sort of serve as a reminder to conserve water. Um, so 
with that, the answer choice to number 16 is going to be A, to remind people of the ongoing need to avoid wasting water, um, the ongoing need to conserve water. Again, in the passage, it says that the stickers made the need to conserve water at all times salient. So A is going to be the answer to number 16. Number 17, as used in line 58, cuts most nearly means. Okay, so let's take a look. <clears throat> Um, squanderers had to participate in a water saving workshop and were subject to an extra day of water cuts. So they cut the water that was available to them. They reduced it. They um, sort of limited it. They um, sort of cut it down, reduced it, limited it, something along those lines. So the answer choice for number 17 is going to be B, reductions. Um, a reductions in the amount of water that they were allowed to use. Moving on, number 18, the conclusion best drawn from the results of the Bogota city government's campaign is that people are, okay, so um, A, more responsive to praise than punishment in most situations. Um, there certainly is talk about, you know, praise and punishment in this idea of, you know, reward and punishment, the idea that people were given posters if they did good and people were given water cuts if they did bad, but we don't, the passage doesn't say which one is more responsive out of the two so a is going to be wrong be interested in learning about new subjects if helpful information is available um, the primary purpose the conclusion of the results isn't about um, interesting interest in learning it's more about um, you know the activism it's more about water conservation it's more about change it isn't much about learning it's more about um, changing behaviors and doing something that's good for the environment see able to educate each other regarding the most effective means of handling emergencies um, people are able to educate each other this is a huge problematic part of the answer choice because if we reflect on what we read in the passage, we really don't see this at all. We don't see, you know, residents telling each other, you know, to conserve water. We see the government taking an active role in making sure water is conserved. So um, C is going to be wrong. So D should be the correct answer for number 18, but we should be able to, you know, sort of find evidence for this. So um, D, the answer choice for D is that um, people are willing to adopt new behaviors if adequate incentives are provided. And we really do see that in this passage. Um, for example, sort of here, the assumption underlying the new strategy, um, you know, this conclusion, the assumption, the conclusion of the um, study, the assumption underlying the new strategy was that conservation would improve if the city created a greater scope for social rewards and punishment to help to reassure people that achieving the public good, continued access to water was likely. Okay, so we do see that. Um, we see this idea of people will be willing to change, people will be willing to adopt new policies if social rewards and punishments are um, put into place, if adequate incentives are provided. So D is the correct answer for number 18, and 19 is just the best evidence question for uh, number 18. And um, again, the lines that we talked about, 63 through 68, this assumption about the uses of social rewards and punishments. So C is going to be the answer to number 19, and D is going to be the answer to number 18. Number 20, according to the figure, water demand in Bogota in 2005. Okay, 2005, water demand in Bogota. So 2005, we see that this graph is right here. Um, I can't highlight it for some reason, but my cursor is right here. And if we go directly up, we see that... Um, this dot right here is about mm, f halfway between 14 and 14.5, so it should be around 14.25. So the correct answer for number 20 is going to be B, 14.25 cubic meters per second. Last question for this passage, number 21. According to the data presented in the figure, water demand in Bogota is best described as having. Okay, so, you know, taking a look at the graph, what trends can we see from... Um, this graph. So A, dropped considerably from 1999 to 2002. Okay, so 1999 is around this third dot on the graph. 
to 2002. We can see that it did drop the first year, but it did increase the next two years after that. So A is going to be wrong. B, risen dramatically from 2000 to 2001. So 2000 to 2001. Um, again, the fourth dot on the graph and the fifth dot on the graph. Is this really a dramatic increase as talked about in the answer choice? No, not really. So B is going to be wrong. Declined steadily. C, declined steadily from 2002 to 2004. Um, 2002 is going to be the sixth thought on this graph and 2004 is the eighth thought and we do see that it declined steadily it declined from around 15 to around 14.25 in these two years so C should be the correct answer D remains stable from 2007 to 2009 um, these last three dots in the graph doesn't show um, that the water demand remains stable it shows that it did increase by quite a significant amount over those two years. So D is going to be the incorrect answer for number 21. So with that said, uh, we've eliminated A, B, and D. So our correct answer for number 21 is going to be C. And that, of course, wraps up this passage. Moving on to the next passage now. This passage is adapted from Ed Young, Razzle Dazzle, 2014 by Read Business Information Ltd. In 1909, the prevailing belief was that animals hid themselves by matching their surroundings. Then the painter and naturalist Abbott Henderson Thayer suggested a different mechanism was at work. Highly conspicuous markings, such as the zebra's stripes and the oyster catcher's black and white plumage, are actually disguises. Predators, he reasoned, locate their prey by looking for their outlines. So animals with high contrast markings that disrupt telltale edges and create false ones can evade detection. Um, sorry about that. Um, so here in the first paragraph, we see already this sort of contradiction between what is already believed and sort of what Thayer came up with. So um, the prevailing belief was that animals matched their surroundings, but um, Thayer believed that animals had high contrast markings that disrupt sort of the predator's ability to um, seek them out and hunt them down. With this and all other idea, with this and other ideas about animal markings, Thayer earned himself the title Father of Camouflage. But although disruptive camouflage was cited in countless textbooks, it remained largely untested until 20, 2005, when Ines Cottill, Martin Stevens, and their colleagues at the University of Bristol, United Kingdom, devised an experiment using fake moths made from paper triangles. By pinning them to oak trees, the researchers found that moths with black markings on the edges were less likely to be attacked by birds than those with central markings or uniform colors. It showed that disruption was indeed a very good way of being hidden, says Stevens, now at the University of Exeter, United Kingdom. Using a similar approach, he and Cuthill later discovered that high contrast markings become less effective once their contrast exceeds that in the creature's natural environment. One way to avoid this for some parts of the body to blend in while others stand out. Cuttle and Stevens revived interest in disruptive camouflage, but the first real insights into just how it works came only last year. Richard Webster at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, asked volunteers to search for virtual moths on a computer screen while an eye track monitored their gaze. We can almost get inside people's eyes, he says. He found that the more patches moths had on their edges, the more often volunteers failed to notice them, and they needed to fixate their gaze on them for longer to have any chance of spotting them. The eye tracking vindicated there again. By breaking up an animal's outline, disruptive camouflage does impair a predator's ability to spot its prey. Although instructive, the experiment had an obvious shortcoming. Humans do not prey on moths, let alone computer-generated ones. To test whether disruptive coloring fools its intended audience, Stephen has started field trials. In Zambia and South Africa, his team is studying ground-nesting birds that rely on disruptive camouflage, including nightjars and plovers. His team measures the patterns on the bird's feathers to quantify how well hidden they are in their environment. They also track the bird's survival to determine how effectively they evade predators. Nightjars and plovers are difficult to spot in the first place, so the researchers have employed sharp-sided local guides to help find them. This raises the question of why, whether predators, like the guides, might be less easily fooled by disruptive markings, as they be have become more familiar with them. Last year, Stevens and his team found that people do gradually get better at spotting virtual moss, especially uh, if they see several at the same time. He suspects that the volunteers learn to stop the futile search for outlines and instead start scanning for high contrast markings. 
Whether non-human predators adopt the same tactic is hard to say. They might not even see camouflage markings in the same way that we do. But if predators can learn to see through disruptive camouflage, it would suggest that this concealment strategy is more likely to evolve in prey that face short-lived or generalist predators than long-lived or specialist ones. And here um, we do have a graph, a figure showing um, the relationship between the number of edge patches and the mean probability of survival, as well as a figure showing the number of edge patches and the mean search time for um, a person to find moth targets. All right, so let's take a look at the questions now. Number 22, the main purpose of the passage is to a, explain how predators are able to hunt animals that use disruptive camouflage as a defense. Um, this makes it seem like the main purpose is on the predators rather than the prey. And if we understood the passage, we know that really the main talking point of the passage is about how camouflage works and studies about this sort of disruptive camouflage, not about how predators are able to hunt animals. So A is wrong. B. Explore how disruptive camouflage helps scientists track wing coloration patterns in moths. Okay, this seems just too specific, something too specific that wasn't even talked about in the passage. Wing coloration patterns in moths. Um, they do talk about sort of the coloration of moths briefly, but that's not really, again, the main purpose of the passage. Um, and again, this isn't sort of um, a question of how scientists track it. It's a question of how this disruptive camouflage works and how effective it is at sort of, um, you know, hiding moths from predators. So B is going to be wrong. C. Discuss the implications of several scientific studies concerning disruptive camouflage. So C is going to be the correct answer because there are, again, several scientific studies concerning disruptive camouflage. Again, the study by Thayer, the study um, by Cuthill, Martin, Stevens, um, and the colleagues at the University of Bristol. Uh, and there were studies, again, um, by... Uh, Richard Webster with the computer moth. So these are the studies and they do discuss the implications of these studies. They talk about um, what this means for predators and what it means for the evolution of these sort of species because uh, they ask the questions like can predators evolve their ability to detect uh, moths even when they're camouflaged. So C is going to be the correct answer for number 22. Number 23, the author's central claim about disruptive camouflage is that it is. Okay, so what is the author's central belief? What is the author's fundamental belief about disruptive camouflage? Um, well, taking a look at the passage, um, we see that Predators, you reason, locate their prey by looking for their outline. So animals with high contrast markings that disrupt telltale edges and create false ones can avoid detection. So we already see that the author sort of goes along with the beliefs of Thayer that um, disruptive camouflage can hide um, prey from their predators. Um, we see later on that the author does um, claim that by breaking up an animal's outline, disruptive camouflage does impair a predator's ability to spot its prey. So again and again, we see throughout the passage that um, the author really believes that disruptive camouflage is sort of an effective way for prey to hide um, themselves from predators. So C is going to be the correct answer for number 23. Uh, disruptive camouflage is a viable defense against particular predators. Uh, disruptive camouflage um, is effective at impairing a predator's ability to spot its prey. Disruptive camouflage... Um, disrupt telltale edges and create, create false ones uh, that can help them evade detection. So C is going to be the correct answer for 23. Number 24, the passage provides a chronological account of how scientists, so a chronological account meaning um, following the passage of time, one comes after the other, comes after the other, comes after the other. And I would say that the only chronological thing in um, this passage is how they um, you know, continually did studies. Um, you know, first it was Thayer, then it was um, Cuthill and Stevens, and then it was Webster. So I can see this chronological development of these studies, and I can see this chronological sort of development of how scientists increase their knowledge on this idea of disruptive camouflage. So the answer to number 24 is going to be A, increase their understanding of a particular camouflage strategy. Um, because the passage, again, just like I talked about, it provides a chronological um, you know, list, an account of all the studies that have been done. And um, these studies 
you know, after they were analyzed and after the results were gotten, they increased their understanding of a particular camouflage strategy. This camouflage strategy, again, being the strategy of um, disruptive camouflage. Number 25, which choice best states the relationship between Cuthill and Stevens' work and Thayer's work? Okay, so um, these two sort of scientists and Thayer. So we can see here that um, sort of in the second paragraph, um, Thayer is the father of camouflage. His disruptive camouflage was cited in countless textbooks, but it remained largely untested until 2005 when Cuthill and Stevens came along and devised an experiment to sort of prove um, Thayer's work. So I would say that um, the relationship between Cuthill and Stevens' work and Thayer's work was that um, Cuthill and Stevens sort of provided scientific evidence and a scientific study to um, prove, give evidence to Thayer's claims about disruptive camouflage. So the answer choice that really goes along with that is A. Cuthill and Stevens provided empirical support. Empirical support meaning, you know, support through data, support through studies, support through scientific evidence for Thayer's theory. Number 26, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? Number 25, um, well, the answer is going to be B, lines 13 through 18. Again, we see here the lines that we just talked about. Um, but although disruptive camouflage was cited in countless textbooks, it remained largely untested until 2005 when Cuthill and Martin Stevens um, came up with this study. So again, it proves that how um, Cuthill and Stevens provided empirical support for Thayer's theory through um, scientific testing. Number 27, the author most likely uses the word countless, line 14 to, okay, so line 14, uh, but through disruptive camouflage, but although disruptive camouflage was cited in countless textbooks, okay, although it was cited in sort of all these textbooks, it was still was uh, largely untested. Um, so it shows that sort of it was widely accepted despite the fact that it was not uh, scientifically tested yet. So the answer choice for number 27 is going to be B uh, because one, it does emphasize the widespread and long-standing acceptance um, because it does show that it was cited in countless textbooks. That means it was widely accepted. Countless textbooks, many textbooks, not just one or two, maybe uh, a couple of textbooks, but countless textbooks, a ton of textbooks talked about this idea of disruptive camouflage. It shows that it was widespread and um, it was long-standing. Uh, it was accepted by a lot of scientists and writers of textbooks. But it does also show that it was an untested theory of camouflage. Um, you know, it remained largely untested until 2005. So B is going to be the answer to number 27. Number 28, as used in line 22, uniform most nearly means. Um, with black markings on their edges were less likely to be attacked by birds than those with central markings or uniform colors. Uniform obviously doesn't mean like, uh, you know, uh, a sports team uniform or like an army uniform or a private school uniform, like a set of clothes that you have to wear. But uniform here means same, like central markings or uniform colors. Uniform colors meaning colors that are the same, colors that blend together, uh, colors that have really no variation. Um, so the answer to number 28 is going to be C. Um, unvarying, again, it gives that meaning of unchanging, the same, uniform, uh, exactly the same. Um, so C is going to be the answer to number 28. 29, in the passage, the author suggests that humans are, and non-human predators may differ in their ability to. So again, we see in the second study, they really consider the difference between human predators and non-human predators. Um, for example, in line 64 through 65, Stevens and his team found that people, humans, do gradually get better at spotting virtual moths, especially if they see several at the same time. They, you know, deduce from their studies that, hey, humans, as we give them more and more tests, they are able to um, get better at spotting out these moths. But are animals the same? Maybe not. Uh, maybe they differ in their ability. Let's take a look. Later in the passage, they take they say that whether non-human predators adopt the same tactic is hard to say. Whether or not um, non-human predators are able to improve their spotting of moths, whether they can improve their ability is hard to say. So that's a difference in their um, ability to you know, perceive um, these moths. They differ in their ability to um, spot these moths that are camouflaged. Um, the study shows that humans can improve 
but it's not sure whether or not uh, non-human predators can do the same. So 29 is gonna be A. They may differ in their ability to perceive visual patterns. They may differ in their ability to um, sort of see camouflage markings in the same way that we do. Camouflage markings, see camouflage markings, go along with perceived visual patterns. Um, so again, the lines that we just talked about were uh, lines 70 through 72, as well as lines uh, 63 through 60, uh, 64, sorry, through 66. And the answer to number 30, which is just the best evidence for the previous question, is going to be D, lines 70 through 72. Again, some of the lines that we just talked about. Number 31, the data in figure 1 best support which statement about the mean probability of survival for the virtual moths? Okay, uh, mean probability of survival for the virtual moths. So let's take a look back at the figure. Um, so figure 1, once again, the mean probability of virtual moths. I don't really know why this is highlighted, but um, we'll just go with it for now. So um, the mean probability of virtual moths. Okay, so we see that um, as the number of edge patches increases, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, the mean probability of survival also increases. So we can see from the figure, we can, you know, sort of deduce from the figure that there is a direct correlation between the number of edge patches in a moth and the mean probability of survival. As one increases, the other increases as well. So this is a correlation between um, the survival and the number of patches. So... D is going to be the correct answer for number 31. Uh, the mean probability increases with the number of edge patches that are present. So as the number of edge patches increases, the mean probability of survival increases with it. We see a, a simultaneous increase between these two variables. So D is the answer to number 31. The last question for this passage, number 32. According to the data presented in figure 2 now, what was the mean search time in seconds to locate virtual moths with exactly 5 edge patches? Okay. So five edge patches, figure two. Number of edge patches here along the x-axis for figure two, uh, we look at five, and uh, sorry about that, we look at five, the leftmost um, uh, marking, and we see that the mean search time, if we go up along the x-axis, where does this um, x equals five line intersect with the, um, the line shown in the graph? And we see that it's gonna be at two seconds. Um, when there are five edge patches, the mean search time is two seconds. So A is going to be the correct answer for number 32. And that wraps up our analysis and our review of the questions for this third passage. Moving on to the next passage now, we have a history double passage. Passage 1 is adapted from a speech delivered to the United Nations General Assembly on 1948 by Eleanor Roosevelt on the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Passage 2 is adapted from Eric Posner, The Case Against Human Rights, 2014 by Guardian News and Media Limited. Passage 1. In giving our approval to the Declaration today, it is of primary importance that we keep clearly in mind the basic character of the document. It is not a treaty. It is not an international agreement. It is not and does not purpo uh, purport to be a statement of law or of legal obligation. It is a declaration of basic principles of human rights and freedoms to be stamped with the approval of the General Assembly by formal vote of its members and to serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples of all nations. So at the beginning, they really say, you know, we have this, you know, declaration, we have this agreement, but it's important not to misunderstand it. It's not an international agreement. It's not a law. It's not a legal ob obligation in any means, but um, it's just a declaration of the basic principles that humans have. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. At a time when there are so many issues on which we find it difficult to reach a common basis of agreement, it is a significant fact that the 58 states have found such a large measure of agreement in the complex in the field of human rights. So they're saying that the signing of this is such a monumentous and a huge occasion because it's very rare that you know 58 states all come together to agree and to sign this one thing. This must be taken as a testimony of our common aspiration first voiced in the Charter of the United Nations to lift men everywhere to a higher standard of life and to a greater enjoyment of freedom. Um, so this is a result. This must be taken as a testimony. This is sort of a result of our common aspiration, the 58 states' common aspiration to lift men to a higher standard of life.
Man's desire for peace lies behind this declaration, the realization that the flagrant violation of human rights by Nazi and fascist countries sowed the seeds of the last world war has supplied the impetus for the work which brings us to the moment achieved here today. So sort of the work achieved here by the declaration was sort of um, set in motion. It was sort of caused by the violation of human rights by the Nazis and the fascist uh, countries of the past. The central fact is that man is fundamentally a moral being and the light we have is imperfect. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, in a recent speech in Canada, Gladstone Murray said, the central fact is that man is fundamentally a moral being, that the light we have is imperfect, does not matter so long as we are always trying to improve it. We are equal in sharing the moral freedom that distinguishes us as men. Men's status makes each individual an end in himself. No man is by nature simply the servant of another state or of another man. The ideal and fact of freedom and not technology are the true distinguishing marks of our civilization. This declaration is based upon the spiritual fact that man must have freedom in which to develop his full stature and through common effort to raise the level of human dignity. We have much to do to fully achieve and to assure the rights set forth in this declaration, but having them put before us with the moral backing of 58 nations will be a great, de great step forward. Okay, now let's take a look at passage two. Many people argue that the incorporation of the idea of human rights into international law is one of great moral achievements of human history. Because human rights law gives rights to all people regardless of nationality, it deprives governments of their traditional riposte when foreigners criticize them for abusing their citizens, namely sovereignty, which is a law speak for none of your business. Thus, international human rights laws provide people with invaluable protections against the power of the state. And yet, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that governments continue to violate human rights with impunity. Why, for example, do more than 150 countries out of 193 countries that belong to the UN engage in torture? Why has the number of authoritarian countries increased in the last several years? Why do women remain a subordinate class in nearly all countries of the world? Why do children continue to work in mines and factories in so many countries? So here they ask questions, you know, if this declaration was effective, if this declaration really served its purpose in, you know, providing individuals invaluable protections against this against the state, then why um, in so many countries, in 150 countries, are there this, this and this? Why is there still torture? Why is there um, still authoritarian countries? Why do women still remain subordinate? Why do children have to work in such bad conditions? The truth is that human rights law has failed to accomplish its objectives. There, uh, sorry about that. It has failed to accomplish its objectives. There is little evidence that human rights treaties on the whole have improved the well-being of people. The reason is that human rights were never as universal as people as hoped. Okay, so this is reasoning. And the belief that they could be forced upon countries as a matter of international law was shot through with misguided assumptions from the very beginning. So this author is saying the reason why this declaration failed was because you know this idea of human rights is never as universal as um, as you know as expected um, and they can't just be forced on countries um, as a matter of sort of international law and uh, as a matter of an international declaration although the modern notion of human rights emerged during the 18th century it is on december 10th 1948 that the story began in earnest with the Adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN General Assembly. The declaration arose from the ashes of the Second World War and aimed to launch a new, brighter era of international relations. The weaknesses that would go on to undermine human rights law were there from the start. The Universal Declaration was not a treaty in the formal sense. No one at the time believed that it created legally binding obligations. It was not ratified by nations, but approved by the General Assembly, and the UN Charter did not give it the general give the General Assembly the power to make international law. Moreover, the rights were described in vague aspirational terms, which could be interpreted in multiple ways. So these are the specific faults that the author of Passage 2 finds with this declaration. The declaration has no legal power. Um, there's no legally binding obligations for the countries. It does not give the General Assembly any power. The wording is vague, it's aspirational, and it can be interpreted in many different ways. So while Passage 1 talks about how um, this declaration is sort of this you know, grand idea, this grand declaration of basic principles, basic human rights, and basic human freedoms, 
and how it's sort of a huge accomplishment that 58 states have come together to sign this, uh, passage two really takes a more negative and uh, is opposing passage one. It's saying that um, in the beginning, while it says that you know human rights laws seem to provide people with invaluable protection, um, the author really goes in deeper at the end, and they really talk about how, in reality, human rights laws, these declarations, have failed to accomplish its objectives, and it gives reasons as to why it has done so. So now that we understand the passage, let's take a look at the questions. Number 33, which choice from passage 1 best supports the idea that in Roosevelt's view, the cooperation of various nations in the development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights marks a major accomplishment? So where does he say that you know all these nations coming together was a huge accomplishment? Well, he does say it in, uh, I mean, not he, but she, because it's Eleanor Roosevelt. She says it in around line 16. It is a significant fact that 58 states have found such a large measure of agreement in the complex field of human rights. Um, so she is saying that, you know, despite this time of difficulty, despite that we all, you know, disagree on certain things, it is a significant accomplishment that we have come together and found agreement um, in this declaration. So again, the lines that we just talked about uh, are in choice B, lines 14 through 18, um, starting at a time and ending human rights. Number 34, as used in line 19, testimony most nearly means. Okay, line 19, this must be taken as a testimony of our common aspiration first voiced in the Charter of the United Nations to lift men everywhere to a higher standard of life and to a greater enjoyment of freedom. So in context, this is talking about the fact that um, the 58 states came together to sign this agreement. And she says that this is a testimony, this is sort of um, a result of the fact that, and this is a sort of confirmation of the fact that we all hold um, it is a common aspiration. We all hold this belief that men everywhere should be lifted to a higher standard. So testimony here really means sort of evidence, proof, a testament, a confirmation, maybe an affirmation of the sorts. So the answer choice for number 34 is going to be A, public affirmation. Moving on to number 35, in passage 1, Roosevelt uses the quotation from Gladstone Murray primarily too. So this is the quotation by Gladstone Murray. It starts in around line 30. And basically Gladstone Murray says in this, um, says in this quote that the central fact of man is fundamentally a moral being. Okay, And he also says that um, we are equal in sharing this moral free moral freedom that distinguishes us as men. Um, this equality, um, Murray believes that men makes the status of men makes each individual equal in an end of himself. No man is by nature simply the servant of the state or another man. So each man possesses this innate freedom and this innate, um, you know, innate sort of sovereignty. Um, when it comes to their own rights. And what does Murray use this you know, speech from Gladstone Murray? I mean, sorry, what does uh, Roosevelt use this speech from Murray to talk about? Well, she says, um, she says that this declaration is based upon the spiritual fact that men have freedom in which to develop his full stature. So she sort of uses Gladstone Murray's um, speech as a sort of introduction to her own point on um, men and freedom and how um, they need to develop um, into their own individual. Um, so if we take a look at the answer choices, we see that the answer choice is going to be D for number 35. Introduce or claim that certain freedoms are required for fulfilling humanity's full potential. What are these um, certain freedoms that are required for fulfilling humanity's full potential? Well, it's the freedoms, these moral freedoms, the freedom that no man can be you know, a servant of another man. There is no um, ownership of a man of another man. These are the freedoms that she's talking about. And um, does she talk about fulfilling humanity's full potential? Well, yeah, she does. Um, she talks about how men need to reach their full potential and how it's a common effort to raise the level of human dignity to reach the full potential of society. Um, we must do this to fully achieve and ensure the rights set forth in this declaration. So that provides evidence for choice D for number 35. Number 36. In passage 2, Posner's use of the phrase, none of your business, lines 55 through 56, primarily serves to create A. Okay, so where does he use this? 
Um, because human rights law gives rights to all people regardless of nationality, it deprives governments of their traditional repost when foreigners criticize them for abusing their citizens, namely sovereignty, which is law speak for none of your business. So a repost is something that um, that is a, like a reply to um, an insult or criticism going off the definition. Um, so, so this line is basically saying that um, it deprives giving humans basic rights, giving citizens basic natural rights to everyone, giving all citizens natural rights. Um, it deprives governments of their traditional sort of reply to when foreigners criticize them for abusing their citizens. Um, it takes away their um, repost, their reply of, oh, this is in the name of sovereignty, which is law speak for none of your business. So he is basically here, um, Posner is basically, you know, revealing some of the problems that he has with the government in saying this. Um, the government says, you know, when foreigners criticize them, they respond with, oh, this abuse is in the name of sovereignty which is law speak for none of your business. So they're basically saying it's none of your business. So Posner basically has a problem with this. This is why he includes this in his um, this explanation of sovereignty in italics. This is why he says, um, he explains it as, oh, it's none of your business. It's because he has a disapproving view of the government using sovereignty as a repost for when foreigners criticize them. So the correct answer choice is going to be D for number 36, a wry tone that conveys a disapproving view of how a term has been used. Sovereignty um, has not been used you know, in the correct way. This is why he disapproves of how sovereignty is being used. Sovereignty is being used to you know, shoo foreigners away and to tell them, oh yeah, this is none of your business. Don't worry about what's going on in your country. And this is what Posner disapproves. So D is the answer to number 36. Number 37. According to passage 2, when did the idea of human rights as we now understand them first begin to develop? Um, so if we take a look, I remember later on in the passage they talk about although the modern notion of human rights emerged during the 18th century. So, you know, in the middle of the 18th century, during the 18th century, this notion of human rights, this movement began to emerge. So B is going to be the correct answer for number 37. It's just going to be a simple information recall question. Number 38, passage 2 most strongly suggests that a significant flaw of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that, okay, so what is a flaw of the um, Declaration of Human Rights? Well, the last paragraph talks about that in passage 2. Um, these weaknesses were that it was not a treaty in the formal sense. It was not a legally binding obligation. It did not give the General Assembly any power. It was written in vague aspirational terms, and it could be interpreted in multiple ways. So these are the weaknesses that Posner points out in passage 2, and these are the weaknesses that we should be looking for in our answer choice. So with that said, the answer choice to number 38 is going to be C, presents the rights such that they lack clear and precise applications. Again, this vague... Um, you know, sorry about that. This vague interpretation, um, the fact that the terms are aspirational, they're vague, they can be interpreted in many different ways. They lack clarity and they lack precise applications. This is the fault that Posner finds with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 38 is going to be C. Number 39, which choice best provides, provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? Best evidence question for the answer C in number 38. And again, the lines that we just talked about, the fact that he talks about how the rights were described in vague aspirational terms, the fact that they could be interpreted in multiple different ways. This provides evidence that the rights you know, lack clear and precise applications. So D is going to be the correct answer for 39. 40. Both passages clarify the nature of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by so what is sort of a similarity between them? Um, a, comparing it to notable international agreements of the past. Um, 
This is kind of looking back in history, oh, maybe comparing this Declaration of Human Rights to like the Declaration of Independence or like whatever something, whatever in the past that was already done. But we don't really see that. We don't really see this, you know, look back into the past. We only see the present and we only talk about this one declaration. No other declaration is mentioned, so A is going to be wrong. B, distinguishing it from legally binding documents. Um, this seems like a very logical answer because both passages talk about um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they talk about how it is different or how it's um, similar to a legally binding document. So in passage one, where do they say this? They say that um, this declaration is not a treaty, it is not an international agreement, it does not have a purpose to be a statement of law or of legal obligation. So passage one says, it distinguishes it, it says it's not a legal binding document, it is a um, declaration of basic principles. It does distinguish um, this declaration from legally binding documents. Does passage two say that? Um, if we take a look in the last passage again, it does say that. It does say that the Universal Declaration was not a treaty in the formal sense. It's not a legally binding formal treaty. Um, no one at the time believed that it created legally binding obligations. No one believed that it was a legally binding document. This is the distinguishing factor between the Declaration of Human Rights and a legally binding document. So 40 is going to be the correct answer for uh, B because in both passages we can see that the Declaration of Human Rights is being distinguished, the differences are being pointed out from legally, traditionally legally binding documents. Number 41. In their discussions of human rights, both passages reflect an underlying concern with, so what are both passages sort of concerned with? Reaction of United Nations officials to new global initiatives of involving human rights. Um, this idea of um, United Nations officials isn't really talked about. Um, the UN officials, you know, maybe they're being addressed in so some of these speeches, but um, they don't really address concern. They don't say, oh, how will the UN nation, uh, nations officials react to this declaration? How will they react to our belief that humans deserve these fundamental rights? There's no sort of speculation on the reactions of these officials. So A is wrong. B, fallibility of key assumptions underlying the idea of universal human rights. Um, the fallibility of key assumptions underlying um, this idea of uh, basic human rights. So um, first, to understand sort of this passage, I mean this answer choice, we have to understand what fallibility means. And fallibility is sort of um, this idea that something or the tendency of something to be incorrect, the tendency of something to be wrong. So he is saying that um, by choosing answer choice B is saying that um, both passages are concerned with um, the fact that key assumptions underlying universal human rights may be wrong. Well, um, we never see that in passage one or in passage two really. Um, passage one talks about you know how human rights is necessary, how human rights should be um, given to everyone, how human rights should be held at a high standard, how human rights need to be implemented to raise society to a higher standard. It never talks about how some key assumptions underlying human rights may be wrong. This isn't really a concern of uh, any of the passages. C. Welfare of people living under oppressive so, uh, social and political circumstances. C seems like a very um, logical answer in that it is supported by the text. Um, where do we see this? Well, in passage one, it does talk about um, the violation of human rights by Nazi and fasc fascist countries. Um, passage two does um, talk about these countries that, you know, torture people, the countries that are authoritarian, the countries that suppress their women, the countries that, you know, continue to overwork children. So we do see this idea of um, the welfare of people in oppressive social and political circumstances being, you know, a concern in both of these passages. So C is going to be the answer to number 41. Number 42, which paragraph of passage 2 presents a view of human rights law that is most consistent with Roosevelt's view of human rights in passage 1? So first of all, what is Roosevelt's view of human rights in passage 1? Roosevelt views human rights as this necessity. She thinks that human rights is necessary to achieve, you know, this 
unity to achieve this fairness to achieve equity and to achieve protection against people um, from their government from oppressive governments from um, you know people that are out to oppress them and to take away their rights um, and so knowing that knowing uh, what Roosevelt's view of human rights in passage one is we should be looking for a paragraph a singular paragraph in passage two that um, agrees with these views so if we you know consider the overall flow of passage two we know at the end they really start to disagree and they start to oppose Roosevelt's points. So logically speaking, we should be looking for a paragraph at the beginning that agrees with Roosevelt's points. And if we read the first passage, um, just to see, we see that you know the main purpose of the passage is that you know international human rights provide people with invaluable protections against the power of the state. And this is in part what Roosevelt talked about in her passage in passage one she does talk about how um, international human rights protect people against the power against the power of you know governments such as the Nazis and the fascists um, so she does talk about this and um, it does align with you know Roosevelt's views so um, pass uh, the first paragraph of passage two is going to be the most similar I think in my opinion at least to um, Roosevelt's claims in passage one because you know as we look on as we read on in passage two we see a transition and yet so he is starting to disagree with Roosevelt's claims so the best choice is going to be the first paragraph in which he talks about some of the merits of international human rights laws so the answer to number 42 is going to be a the first paragraph lines 48 through 58 and that wraps up this passage Moving on to the last passage now, it's going to be a science passage. This passage is adapted from Sid Perkins, Can Sea Monkeys Stir the Sea, 2014 by American Association for the Advancement of Science. Winds, waves, and tides are crucial for mixing the surface waters of lakes and seas, transporting heat downward and simultaneously bringing nutrient-rich waters up to the surface where light-harvesting phytoplankton need them to thrive. But small marine creatures help such processes as they migrate to the ocean surface each night to forage and then return to the relative safety of unlit depths during daylight hours, some researchers think. One of the most familiar of these travelers, known to kids worldwide as a sea monkey, is the brine shrimp. Atermia salina, says John DeBiri, a fluid dynamicist at the California Institute of Technology. Although the small swirls created by the fast turning legs of a single sea monkey are not strong enough to significantly stir the seas, the eddies kicked up billions of them uh, kicked up by billions of them might do the trick. Debiri and others have proposed. To test the notion, he and Mon Monica Wilhelmus, also of Caltech, measured the tiny currents triggered by artificially induced migrations of brine shrimp in the lab. Um, so here we have sort of a scientific inquiry, you know, can sea monkeys um, mix the surfaces of water? And then we have the um, the research method, the experiment. Um, to test the notion, you know, he goes to the lab to artificially induce, you know, migrations of brine shrimp. Debiri and Wilhelmus use blue and green lasers to induce thousands of five millimeter long brine shrimp to migrate to and from the bottom of a 1.2 meter deep tank. The creatures are strongly attracted to those colors, Debiri says. The researchers uh, shone the blue laser in, into the tank and moved it slowly up and down to control the crustacean's uh, vertical movements. The tank's solid walls could strongly affect the flow patterns generated by the shrimp as they swam. So the researchers kept the shrimp away from the edges of the tank by shining the green laser beam directly down into the center. To help visualize the swirls and eddies generated by the shrimp, the researchers added copious amounts of silver-coated microspheres to the water and illuminated them with a red laser, a color that doesn't seem to affect the shrimp's behavior. The team's high-speed videos of the teeming laser-lit migrations captured images of swirls much larger than the creatures themselves, which resulted from the interactions of smaller flows created by individuals. The larger the swirls, the more effective the mixing might be, Debiri says. 
So even for slow migrations, there could be strong effects, he notes. Previous studies suggest that light harvesting phytoplankton, the base of the ocean's food chain, collect about 60 terawatts of solar energy, Debiri says, even if marine organisms that consume phytoplankton convert only 1% of that power into mixing the oceans, that's collectively comparable to the mixing power of winds and tides, Debiri and Wilhelmus report. This is a really innovative experimental setup that provides a nice illustration of flow velocities, says Christian Noss, a fluid dynamicist at the University of Koblenz Landau. Jeanette Yang, Yen, a biological oceanographer at the Georgia Institute of Technology, agrees. I like the idea of using the shrimp's behavior to lure them to the camera, she says. So here are some sort of other scientists' opinions on their experiment. But scientists, okay, but a transition here, but scientists disagree on how effective billions of churning sea monkey legs might be in blending ocean layers that are hundreds of meters deep. I wouldn't want to say just yet that biomixing is important at a global scale, solely based on a lab experiment, says Stefan Monosmith, a fluid mechanicist at Stanford University. Andre Visser, a physical oceanographer at the Technical University of Denmark, agrees. Most of the energy from the shrimp probably goes into heating the water rather than mixing it, he says. So these two scientists are not so quick to agree with the uh, results presented by the study of Wilhelmus and um, the other guy. Uh, what was his name? Debiri. Debiri and Wilhelmus. Um, they believe that, you know, there isn't an implication of this at a global scale. And also, they're skeptical as to whether or not you know the energy from mixing goes into uh, mixing it or heating the water. In fact, the upper and lower layers of the seas have measurable differences in density, a stratification that, according to the theory, would reduce the efficiency of any biomixing. And subsequently, experiments similar to Debiri's suggested that stratification stifles mixing. In that research, Noss and colleague Andreas Lorke, also of Koblenz Landau, studied the effects of large crowds of aquatic creatures called Daphnia, commonly known as water fleas, as they migrated up and down in a tank of mildly stratified water. As expected, the stratification squelched the biomixing generated by the swimming Daphnia, Noss says. Those results aren't surprising, Visser says. It's difficult to lift heavy water up and to push light water down. Debiri and his colleagues, next set of lab experiments will look at the effects of sea monkey migrations in stratified waters, he says. Those experiments should reveal whether sea monkeys are better mixers than water fleas. So towards the oh sorry about that towards the end of the experiment um, we see sort of a transition into um, the topic of water stratification and the experiments made by other scientists on water fleas. So now that we've sort of read through the passage, uh, let's take a look at the questions. Number forty three. The main purpose of the passage is to. So without looking at the answer choices, I can say that the main purpose of the passage is to discuss some experimental data. Um, this passage is really focused on experiments. There isn't really a ton of discussion. There isn't a lot of theory. It's about the experiments that were done by the scientists and what the experiments could say about possible biomixing by um, whether it be water fleas, whether it be um, sea monkeys, whether it be whatever. So um, taking a look at the answer choices, a says, describe field observations of a particular type of biomixing. What is this particular type of biomixing? And also field observations. Field observations mean that it's not in a lab. It means that scientists are actually going out into the wild and, you know, watching sea monkeys mix the water. And we know that this isn't, case, isn't the case because uh, the scientists in the passage created an artificial environment for the sea monkeys to, you know, mix the waters. So A is wrong. B, present a new scientific consensus. Okay, this is automatically just very suspect because a scientific consensus means that, you know, this theory is maybe proven or it's widely held among a lot of scientists. And immediately we already see that this is wrong because if we recall later in the passage, um, the passage really gives the opinion of two scientists that sort of disagree with um, the effectiveness of the water mixing by the sea monkey. So B is going to be wrong. C. Discuss experimental research. Okay, there is experimental research because, again, we talk about a lot of different kinds of studies on a possible example of biomixing. Um, this is the safest answer, and it's going to be the correct answer for number 43 because both parts of the answer choice are going to be satisfied by the passage. Discuss experimental research. Yes, that is 
um, talked about a lot by the passage. They talk about a bunch of different uh, scientists, and they talk about their work in uh, disc in you know researching biomixing, and um, yeah. Uh, as for the second part of the, part of the passage, discussing experimental research on a possible example of biomixing, well, yeah, uh, this possible example of biomixing is biomixing that is done by sea monkeys. So C is going to be the correct answer for number 43. Number 44, the main purpose of the discussion of blue and green lasers is to. So let's take a look at where the passage talks about blue and green lasers. So um, the paragraph that sort of jumps out at me at the beginning is going to be the second paragraph. Debiri and Wilhelmus use blue and green lasers to induce thousands of five millimeter long brine shrimp to migrate to and from the bottom of a 1.2 meter tank. So the key word here is going to be induce. The blue and green lasers induced this migration of the shrimp. So sort of we can see here that the purpose, the use of the blue and green lasers was to guide the shrimp, to drive the shrimp to sort of migrate from one end of the tank to another. So with that, uh, if we take a look at the answer choices for number 44, we see that the answer is going to be B, to describe how the researchers attempted to guide the motions of the brine shrimp. They used the blue and the green lasers to induce the migration, to guide the motions, and to guide the migrations of the brine shrimp from one end of the tank to another. So B is the answer to number 44. Number 45, the passage most strongly suggests that in designing their experiment, De Beery and Wilhelmus tried to exclude the possibility that. So in their experimental design, they tried to control the environment so that this thing wouldn't occur. So let's see, what is this thing that they're talking about? Um, so here uh, we see that the tank's solid walls could strongly affect the flow patterns generated by the shrimp as they swam. So what did they do to exclude this possibility? The researchers kept the shrimp away from the edges by shining the green laser beam directly down the center. So here we you know, see specific evidence for an answer to number 45. Um, so what is what is um, the thing that might, you know, alter the results of their experiment? Well, it's going to be the fact that um, the tank solid walls could strongly affect the flow patterns generated by the shrimp as they swam. And how did they try to exclude this possibility? Well, they did that by keeping the shrimp away from the edges of the tank by shining the green laser beam directly down in the center. Um, so so to answer the question, the answer to number 45 is going to be C. The apparatus in which the brine shrimp were held influenced the results of the experiment. So in, um, in the experiment, by uh, shining the green laser beam and keeping the shrimp away from the edges, they are excluding the possibility, they are preventing the possibility that the solid walls could affect the flow patterns generated by the shrimp as they swam. They prevented the possibility that the apparatus or the solid walls um, could influence the results of the experiment. So 45 is going to be C. 46 is the best evidence question for number 45. Um, and again, the lines that we just talked about um, are going to be the answer choice for that. So 46 is going to be B, lines 29 through 33. Again, the lines that we talked about, the solid walls and how they affect the flow patterns and how the researchers tried to fix this problem. The fact that they shown the green, they shined the green laser into the tank and they prevented the fish um, or the sea monkeys rather from swimming to the edge of the tank. Number 47, as used in line 40, captured most nearly means. Okay, the team's high-speed videos of the teeming laser-lit migrations captured images. Okay, so captured images here means recorded images. They took images, um, something along those lines. So 47 is going to be C, recorded. It's just the word that goes, you know, best in the context of the sentence. Number 48, the quotations from Nas and Yen, lines 54 through 61, primarily serve too. Okay, so 54 through 61, we see that this is going to be the uh, fifth paragraph of this passage. This is a really innovative experimental setup that provides a nice illustration of flow velocity, says Nas. Jeanette Yen, a biological oceanographer at the Georgia Institute of Technology, agrees. I like the idea of using the shrimp's behavior to lure them to the camera, she says. So sort of this paragraph, um, if I were to put it into my own words, is really the opinion of two uh, scientists. 
the opinion and maybe what each of these two scientists like about the experimental setup that um, De Beery and Wilhelmus are doing. So with that said, the answer choice to 48 is going to be A, to provide expert evaluations of the experimental methods used by De Beery and Wilhelmus. Um, provide expert evaluations, they are experts, you know, one is a fluid dynamicist at the University of Koblenz-Landau, the other is a biological oceanographer at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and they do talk about the experimental methods used by De Beery and Wilhelmus. They talk about how they use the behavior of the shrimp, they talk about how they use the camera, they talk about how the experimental setup is really innovative. So that points to the experimental methods. So 48 is going to be A. Number 49, according to the passage, Mona Smith is not convinced that De Beery and Wilhelmus' results can be. So where does you know, Mona Smith um, talk about his shortcomings with the experiment that De Beery and Wilhelmus are doing? So here we see his name, Stefan Mona Smith. Um, he says that most of the energy... Uh, oh, no, actually, that's from Andre Visser. So Stefan Monosmith is actually the stuff that says before. I wouldn't want to say yet that biomixing is important at a global scale, solely based on the lab experiment, said Stefan Monosmith. So basically, um, to sort of simplify what he's saying, he says that, you know, just because we see this result in a lab doesn't mean it has applications in the real world. So Monosmith basically is doubting um, the validity of the experimental results on a larger scale. So 49, the answer is going to be A. Um, Mona Smith is not convinced. He has doubts that the experiment of De Beery and Wilhelmus uh, can be generalized to the natural environment. Generalized, meaning projected on a larger scale to the natural environment, this natural environment, the, the world on a bigger scale. Um, so we see this correlation, generalized to the natural environment and important at a global scale. He doubts that it's important at a global scale, so we can choose the answer choice that talks about the fact that he's doubtful that it can be generalized to the natural environment. So really, uh, a pretty straightforward correlation there. 49 is going to be A. Um, so the last three questions here. Number 50. Which choice best supports the idea that the migration of brine shrimp may not have the effect suggested by De Beery and Wilhelmus? So keep in mind, what is the effect that was suggested, originally suggested um, by De Beery and Wilhelmus? Well, their theory was that um, the migration of the brine shrimp mixes the waters. They, you know, uh, bring the waters at the bottom of the ocean to the top and then the top at the bottom, and then they sort of mix waters in these way. So um, if we're looking for a correct answer choice to number 50, we're looking for an answer choice that talks about an effect that is not mixing the water. And immediately, we're going to point to sort of these lines around line 70, um, where Andre Visser says that most of the energy probably goes into heating the water rather than mixing it, he says. So this uh, sort of statement by Andre Visser, um, it points to the idea that the migration of brine shrimp may not actually be mixing the water. It may just be heating the water and that the results of De Beery and Wilhelmus' experiments are wrong. So uh, really the correct answer choice for number 50 is going to be B. Number 51, as used in line 82, mildly most nearly means. Line 82, um, Daphnia, commonly known as water fleas, as they migrated up and down in a tank of mildly stratified water. So we know that um, mildly here means that the water wasn't completely stratified. It wasn't um, fully stratified, but it was mildly stratified. So mildly might here mean um, partially, maybe slightly, not um, fully stratified. Um, so let's look for an answer choice that talks about that. Um, so 51 is going to be D, moderately stratified. Again, moderately takes on this um, definition that it's not complete, it's just moderate, maybe to a partial extent um, that it was, the water was stratified, not completely. So that's going to be the correct answer for number 51. It's going to be D.
Number 52, the last question on this reading section. The information about the study of water fleas is provided primarily as evidence in support of the idea that. So what does the why did um, the passage choose to bring up the study of water fleas? So let's see. Um, Daphnia commonly noticed water fleas as they migrated up and down in the tank of mildly stratified water. So we see um, this connection between water fleas and stratified water. But what is it trying to prove? As expected, the stratification quelched the biomixing generated by the swimming uh, Daphnia. So here they are basically saying that um, this data provided by the water fleas shows that the stratification of the water um, kind of prohibits the biomixing by the water fleas. So we should be looking for an answer that talks about that. Um, so the answer to number 52 is going to be D. Water stratification reduces the likelihood of successful biomixing. Again, we see that um, the success of the biomixing is reduced because stratification squelched the biomixing generated by the swimming Daphne as it talks about specifically in the text. So number 52 is going to be D. And that wraps up um, our analysis of this reading section. Moving on to the writing section now. Passage 1, Dinosaur Disaster. Roughly 65 million years ago, dinosaurs, along with 65 to 70 percent of other plant and animal species on Earth, became extinct. This massive wave of extinctions which makes the end of the Cretaceous geologic period, has long fascinated scientists their proposal of numerous explana explanations for it. The most well-known of these is the Alvarez hypothesis, which holds that a gigantic asteroid struck the planet, causing climate change and ecosystem collapse. So this first question, number one, this is just purely punctuation. Uh, this sentence contains a dependent and independent clause. So this first part is um, dependent, whereas the second part is independent. And if you remember the punctuation lesson, if it's unnecessary information that just serves as like a description, it should be separated from the rest of the sentence by a pair of commas. So along with 65 to 70 percent of other plant and animal species on Earth, that's kind of unnecessary information to go along with dinosaurs here. And since we can see a comma here, there should be a comma before this. So it should be after dinosaurs. And the correct answer for one is B. All right, two. Um, this massive wave of extinctions, which makes the end of the Cretaceous geologic period, has long fascinated scientists, their proposal of numerous explanations for it. So uh, this is obviously incorrect because there just doesn't make sense. And um, since we want to maintain active voice, we want to say that the scientists proposed these explanations. So it should be C and D. One of those is the correct answer. And um, if you remember how to link two independent clauses, which is what's done here, you either use like a semicolon or colon. If there's only a comma, then there has to be a fanboys conjunction. So for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so one of those. And since and right here is one of those, C is the correct answer for two. The Alvarez hypothesis first emerged in 1980. In that year, scientists Luis and Walter Alvarez noted the high level of iridium, an element that is rare on Earth but abundant in asteroids and layers of rock from the Cretaceous period. They proposed that iridium could be evidence of a massive asteroid strike. This hypothesis gained additional support in the 1990s after researchers determined that a 110 mile wide, mile wide crater near the town of Chicxulub, Mexico was likely caused by an asteroid strike at the end of the Cretaceous period. The asteroid's impact would have ejected a tremendous amount of iridium-containing dust into the, into the atmosphere, blocking sunlight and resulting in global cooling and a darkness that would have halted photosynthesis. These sudden environmental shifts would have rapidly driven many species to extinction, a conclusion supported by sharp declines in the levels of plankton and pollen in the fossil record after the asteroid strike. So number, th uh, number three, which choice best combines the sentences at the underlined portion? The Alvarez hypothesis first emerged in 1980. In that year, scientists Luis and Walter Alvarez. So we know that 1980 is a year. So um, it's it should be unnecessary to mention year. So A and B don't really make sense. So it's between C and D as the correct options. And D is just too wordy. So we're going to go to C. The 
the Alvarez hypothesis first emerged in 1980 when uh, scientist Luis and Walter Alvarez noted the high level of iridium. That's the most concise and correct answer. Number four, the asteroid's impact would have ejected a tremendous amount of iridium containing dust into the atmosphere, blocking sunlight and resulting in global cooling and a darkness that would have halted photosynthesis. So, um, this seems pretty good as is. If we check all the other choices, they don't really make as much sense. So blocking sunlight with results being global cooling, that doesn't make sense. And resulting two, that's almost correct, but in is a better word than two. And with results in global cooling doesn't really work. So A, no change is the best choice for number four. All right, number five. The writer's considering deleting the underlined portion adjusting the punctuation as needed. Should the underlined portion be kept or deleted? So this underlined portion, uh, these sudden environmental shifts would have rapidly driven many species to extinction, a conclusion supported by sharp declines in the level of plankton and pollen in the fossil record after the asteroid strike. So this sentence here talks about how, like in the fossil record, um, there were sharp declines in the levels of plankton and pollen, which means these died off a lot. And since these are at the bottom of like the food chain, we can like assume that there were, you know, uh, far reaching effects. And since before, or this paragraph talks about how this asteroid strike could have led to the mass extinction. And then this says after the asteroid strike, plankton and pollen declined. I think it's a pretty good supporting detail. So the correct answer should be kept A or B. And the most correct uh, reasoning is B. It provides evidence of the sudden environmental shifts. The Alvarez hypothesis, however, is challenged by research that suggests gradual environmental changes caused by volcanic eruptions occurring before the asteroid collision had already stressed dinosaur populations. Finally, a range of volcanoes in western India called the Deccan Traps is thought to have been the site of several huge eruptions near the end of the Cretaceous period. According to Princeton University geologist Gerda Keller, Climate altering gas and dust clouds from these volcanic eruptions could have caused most of the extraction, most of the extinctions during this period, leaving the few surviving dinosaur species to be eliminated by the asteroid impact. So number six, which choice best maintains the tone established in the passage? This is just a simple tone question. Um, challenged, badgered, defied, besieged. Challenged is the best choice because it gets the meaning across that, like, you know, research is kind of like opposing the Alvarez hypothesis that like solely the asteroid strike is responsible for that. All the others are just, um, they, yeah, they just contain like too informal of a tone. Number seven, this is a transition uh, word problem. So yeah, um, finally, a range of volcanoes in Western India called the Deccan Traps thought to have been the site of several huge eruptions near the end of the Cretaceous period. So when we're solving these transition word problems, we want to see the relationship of the sentence after the transition to the sentence before. So the sentence before talks about how um, research shows that volcanic eruptions before the asteroid could have stressed dinosaur populations. And then the next sentence provides like an example of these um, volcanic ranges, the Deccan Traps in India, which is, and it provides the detail that these are thought to be the site of these huge eruptions um, yeah, so this is a supporting detail to the first sentence. And um, the best choice to get that message across that, like, you know, the next sentence is a supporting detail is C, in fact. Um, however, furthermore, and finally just convey the wrong message. Okay, number eight. Um, a range of volcanoes in Western India called the Deccan Traps is thought to have been the site of several huge eruptions. So uh, this seems fine as is. Uh, a lot of this just focuses on commonly confused words. So B and C are incorrect because site and site, these spellings are wrong. Um, S-I-T-E is like a location, which is the correct meaning. C-I-T-E is um, incorrect and S-I-G-H-T is also incorrect. So B and C are incorrect. And then D-T-O-O -O is incorrect. So A, no change is the best answer for eight. All right, uh, number nine. 
Climate altering gas and dust clouds from these volcanic eruptions could have caused most of the extinctions during this period, leaving the few surviving dinosaur species to be eliminated by the asteroid impact. Um, uh, let's see, this is a combination of an independent and dependent clause. So it makes sense to have the comma here. Um, and this is just process of elimination. If you try all the other ones, A is still the best choice. So no change is the correct answer. In a 2010 article, dozens of scientists reaffirmed the Chicxulub asteroid as the most likely cause of the Cretaceous extinctions, but the available evidence on dinosaur, ex dinosaur extinctions suggests that environmental changes from these eruptions could have made dinosaurs more vulnerable to the devastation caused by the asteroid strike. The impact of the Chicxulub asteroid continues to be viewed as the event that ended the age of the dinosaurs, but the actual number of species that became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous experience at the end of the Cretaceous period has been a subject of debate. So number 10, which choice most logically introduces the information in the rest of the sentence? Um, so the rest of the sentence talks about how like environmental changes from the eruptions that were discussed before, possibly from like a volcanic range in India, could have made dinosaurs more vulnerable. So. The choice that just best introduces that information, um, like the information that the eruptions, not just the asteroid, could have contributed to the extinction, the correct choice is just B. Most researchers dispute Keller's hypothesis that the, uh, that the Deccan eruptions directly cause the majority of the Cretaceous extinctions. Uh, number 11. The writer wants to reinforce, reinforce the assertion in the previous sentence in a way that reflects the main idea of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So um, the previous sentence, it talks about how like, we're not really certain how the asteroid, like how much it contributed to the extinction. Was it the volcanic eruptions and the asteroid or was it the asteroid itself? So we don't really know that. Um, so the best choice, if you look through all of these is C, that best addresses, um, you know, the previous sentences like discussion of the debate over the asteroid. So yeah, but whether it did so by itself or so was, as geologist Paul Wren puts it, the final straw, but not the sole cause, will likely inspire research and debate for years to come. This just best addresses the idea that we're not really sure like how the asteroid contributed to the extinction. All right, moving on to passage two, not so ancient poetry. In the late 1700s, readers across Europe got a big kick out of a series of poems pur purportedly written by Ossian, a legendary Scottish poet and storyteller from the third century. Ossian was said to have worked in the oral rather than the written tradition, and the French general Napoleon Bonaparte so admired the poems to where he commissioned two paintings of Ossian to be hung in his summer palace. There was just one problem. The poems were largely the invention of their so-called translator, James McPherson. McPherson was a Scottish Highlander who grew up listening to songs and stories in the Gaelic language. When he began his career as a school teacher in Ruthven, Scotland, he set about collecting the tales and ballads of the region. A friend persuaded him to translate the Gaelic poem, The Death of Oscar, into English. And in 1760, McPherson published his translation, along with translations of several other poems in a, in a volume entitled Fragments of Ancient Poetry. So number 12, which choice is most consistent with the style used throughout the passage? Um, all, pretty much all these choices are too informal, got a big kick out of, got a rush from, and were tickled pink by. So the best choice is just D, we're thrilled by, because that one has the most uh, scholarly tone, I guess. Number 13, which choice provides a, a supporting example that is most similar to the other example in the sentence? So the other example in the sentence talks about how Napoleon Bonaparte admired Ossian's poems and commissioned two paintings of him to be hung in his summer palace. So I think the best um, detail here, I guess supporting example, should like be talking about how you know great or admired he was because Napoleon Bonaparte also admired him. So the best choice is B. Literary critics compared Ossian to the, to the revered poets Homer and Dante. All right, number 14. Napoleon Bonaparte so admired the poems to where he commissioned two paintings of Ossian to be hung in his summer palace. Uh, just substitute all these answers here. Um, D is the correct answer, that. 15. 
McPherson was a Scottish Highlander who, who grew up listening to songs and stories in the Gaelic language. Um, this is another one where you just substitute it in. The best choice is actually the one that's already there. So A, no change is correct. If you substitute all the others, they just have unnecessary punctuation or are just too wordy. The fragments immediately captured the public's imagination. Equally captivating was McPherson's hint in the preface that an epic poem, a poem chronicling heroic deeds of great significance to a culture, might be recovered through further study of ancient manuscripts and oral traditions in the Highlands. Excited patrons provided McPherson with funds to undertake a research trip. They were not disappointed. In spite of their contributions, McPherson published two epic poems, Fingal and Tamora, which recounted the feats of ancient Gaelic warriors. McPherson claimed that the poems had been written by Ossian. The influential English author Samuel Johnson demanded to see the original manuscripts that McPherson had translated. When McPherson refused, Johnson accused him of fraud and undertook a trip to Scotland to debunk McPherson's claims. Johnson provided a formal account of his, of his suspicions in his 1775 travel book, A Journey to the Western Islands of Scotland. So, number 16. This is just, um, yeah, finding the right words to combine these two sentences. So, excited patrons provided McPherson with funds to undertake a research trip. They were not disappointed. Since this combines two independent clauses, there shouldn't be a comma unless there's a conjunction. Um, if there isn't a conjunction, there should be like a semicolon or colon, but since none of the options offer that, the only correct choice is C, um, trip, comma, and. Number 17. In spite of their contributions, McPherson published two epic poems. So this is talking about what um, McPherson did after uh, he was, he undertook a research trip funded by patrons and in spite of their contributions is not really correct because that kind of like implies that uh, the donations made for his research trip kind of hindered him which is not true so the correct choice is just c in the years that followed because that kind of describes you know the time period um i guess that he spent working on supposedly translating these poems. So yes, C is the best choice for this. 18, at this point, the writer wants to include an effective transition from the previous paragraph to the rest of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So the um, previous paragraph talks about McPherson's trip, and it says that McPherson claimed that the poems had been written by Ossian. And then this one talks about how Samuel Johnson doubted that McPherson had actually translated these from poems that Ossian writ or he wrote. So the correct choice is B because it discusses how a controversy arose. So yeah, that's the best one. 19. The influential English author Samuel Johnson de demanded to see the original manuscripts that McPherson had translated. Since this is all just one clause, it's not two combined. Uh, we don't need any punctuation here. So the correct choice is B. The public remained divided between those who believed in the poem's authenticity and those who agreed with Johnson that the poems were a hoax. Today, it is believed that McPherson created the Ossian text by combining poetry and stories he had heard on his travels with invented material of his own invention. Having set out to find an epic poet in the Highlands, he created one by attributing these amalgamated works to the mythic Ossian. Although many modern critics do not share Johnson's hostility toward McPherson, Johnson was ultimately correct in thinking that poems such as Fingal and Tamora are better understood as the work of an 18th century poet than as a third century one. So 20, the writer is considering adding the following sentence. The Ossian incident is mentioned only briefly in James Boswell's 1791 bi biography, Life of Johnson. Should the writer make this addition here? So these sentences are talking about how this one says the public you know, they never reached like a full consensus on whether it was a hoax. And then the next sentence talks about how um, the Austin texts were actually a hoax. And it just explains how McPherson uh, created these. However, this is not related to any of that information at all. So the correct choice is D. It blurs the focus of the paragraph by introducing extraneous information regarding Johnson. 21. 
Today, it is believed that McPherson created the Ossian text by combining poetry and stories he had heard on his travels with invented material of his own invention. Since it already says of his own invention, you don't need to say invented or made up, which means the same thing. So the best choice is D, material. 22. Johnson was ultimately correct in thinking that poems such as Fingal and Tamar are better understood as the work of an 18th century poet than as a third century one. So um, we need a pronoun here to refer to work because uh, when you say then as a third century one, that's just unclear. So the best choice is passage three, USPS, you can bank on it. In 2014, the Office of Inspector General of the United States Postal Service, USPS, released a report containing a surprising recommendation post offices should offer their customers banking services such as refillable debit cards, check cashing, and offering small loans. Although the idea may seem strange at first, postal banking has benefited people in many parts of the world and could do so in the United States as well. A postal banking system would rely on the existing network of post offices to provide essential financial services to residents throughout the United States. In some countries such as Brazil, post offices partner with commercial banks. In others, such as Japan, the postal service itself acts as a full-scale bank, offering loans and savings accounts. The diverse array of su successful postal banking systems around the world shows that post offices can provide many of the same services like banks. So 23, this is just punctuation. Um, the Office of Inspector General of the United States Postal Service released a report containing a surprising recommendation. Post offices should offer their customers banking services. <laughs> So the colon makes sense here because it's combining two independent clauses and a semicolon would also work in the situation. But since none of the choices have a semicolon, colon is the best option. And also uh, when you're using a colon, the part afterwards should kind of like explain or give a supporting detail to the part before, which is, uh, which is what's done here. Uh, it talks about the surprising recommendation and that recommendation is that they should offer their customers banking services. So the, uh, the comma here is incorrect for C because that's you said join an independent and dependent clause, which is not the case here. This is incorrect B because um, there's just no punctuation where there should be right after recommendation. And then D, it kind of makes sense, but then the colon at the end, uh, it lets you know that it's definitely not correct because that shouldn't be there. All right, 24. Uh, post offices should offer their customers banking services such as refillable debit cards, check cashing, and offering small loans. So this is listing things that post offices should offer their customers. They should offer them debit cards. They should offer them check cashing. They shouldn't offer them offering small loans. That doesn't make sense. So offering shouldn't be here because offer already um, takes care of every noun in the list. So the best choice for 24 is just C and small loans, you just delete offering. 25, which choice provides the best transition from the previous sentence to the sentences that follow in the paragraph? So the sentences that follow in the paragraph talks about, um, like in Brazil, there's postal banking, uh, because it says post offices partner with banks. It also talks about how in Japan, there's also a postal banking system. And since in the previous paragraph, it says postal banking has benefited people in many parts of the world and could do so in the United States as well. We know that the best transition should discuss how postal banking is being implemented in different parts of the world. So the best choice for 25 is B. Such systems already exist in 50 countries and provide services to about 1 billion people. 26. The diverse array of successful postal banking systems around the world shows that post offices can provide many of the same services like banks. Uh, the best the best way to solve this is just do process of elimination. So like banks doesn't sound right, so we can just uh, eliminate A. Uh, that, okay, banking systems around the world shows that post offices can provide many of the same services of banks. Uh, it seems all right. Many of the same services that banks provide, that seems like the best choice. And if we try D, they can provide many of the same services with those offered by banks. That's not correct. So 26 is C. 
Okay. There's a real need for an institution to fill this role in several parts of the United States because people have increasingly been looking to switch from nationwide bank branches to smaller independent banks. An average of more than 2,300 bank branches close in the United States each year in the time period between the years 2010 and 2013, leaving customers in many parts of the country living in bank deserts. So 27, which choice most effectively introduces a main claim of the paragraph? The paragraph talks about how um, a, a bunch of bank branches closed, tw uh, 2,300 to be exact. Uh, that much closed in just these three years between 2010 and 2013. So the, um, the best choice to introduce should probably talk about bank closures. And the best choice is B for 27. Many branches of nationwide banks have closed in recent years. Uh, moving on to 28. An average of more than 2,300 bank branches closed in the United States each year in the time period between the years 2010 and 2013. It's definitely unnecessary to say in a uh, time period because 2010 to 2013, that is a time period. You don't need to say that. And then between the years, uh, we already know that they're years, so we can kind of get rid of that too. So the best, most concise choice is D, between. If you try process of elimination, uh, you'll still come out with D as the best choice for 28. All right, I'm gonna start from this sentence before. Wait. All right, an average of more than 2,300 bank branches closed in the United States each year between 2010 and 2013, leaving customers in many parts of the country living in bank deserts, areas without local banks. The USPS is ideally suited to undertake this lack of access because many post offices, more than half of them in fact, are located in zip codes with fewer than two bank branches. Approximately 60% of post offices are located in zip codes with one or more banks. So it also it's also important to look at a graph and just make sense of the information. So the point right here is that postal banking is good because many parts of the country have like bank closures, leaving people without good banks, yet post offices are in these areas without banks and they can fill that need. So uh, we'll look at this 38% of post offices in zip codes with no banks. I'd say this is the most uh, important statistic because this is talking about how post offices can fill the needs of people in areas with no banks or with limited access to banks. 21% post offices in zip codes with one bank and 41% post offices and zip codes with at least two banks. So 29. Um, the USPS is ideally suited to undertake this lack of access. So undertake is generally when you like, you know, take on a project or something, like you undertake a job or something, but if it's an issue, you don't undertake it, you like face it. So undertake is not the right word. Uh, the best choice for 29 is C, address. Yeah. Because the USPS addresses this lack of access to banks. That's the best choice for 29. All right, 30. Um, because many post offices, more than half of them, in fact, are located in zip codes with fewer than two bank branches. So which choice provides accurate information from the chart? Um, so this is talking about the number in zip codes with fewer than two bank branches. That's those in zip codes with zero or one. So if you add those, 38 plus 21 is about 59%. So it is true that it's more than half of them. So A, no change could work, but we'll try all the others. Uh, B, almost all of them. 59% isn't almost all, so that's wrong. Roughly 40%, that's wrong. And D, 20%, that's wrong. So A, no change is the best choice. 31. The writer wants to conclude the paragraph with accurate, relevant information from the chart that most effectively reinforces the point the writer is making. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So um, the point of this paragraph is to talk about how post offices are located in areas with limited access to banks. So it should be the one that contains like a good statistic about this. Um, so B is the best choice. 38% of post offices are located in zip codes with no bank branches at all. This supports the author's main point that post offices, if they offer postal banking, can be of great service to people because um, over a third of them, close to 40% actually, are located in zip codes with no bank branches and are therefore probably the best source of banking for people who otherwise would not have access to these services. 32, 
Oh, I'm going to read this first. Although postal banking is effective in other countries, many post offices are located in regions where banks are critically needed. Some criticals of the proposal contend that post offices are ill-equipped to act as banks. Postal banking would indeed significantly ex expand the range of the USPS's duties. However, as Inspector General David C. William notes, U.S. post offices currently offer many similar products. The post office already sells money orders, runs a huge cash retail business, sells insurance on parcels, and cashes treasury checks. Even postal banking itself has a precedent in the United States. From, uh, from 1911 to 1967, the postal savings system allowed people to hold saving accounts at their local post offices. Offering financial services would represent a significant transformation of the USPS, but there's every reason to believe that it would be a change for the better. With many citizens now living in bank deserts, offering such services would represent a significant investment in U.S. communities. All right, number 32. Although postal banking is effective in other countries, many post offices are located in regions where banks are critically needed. Some critics of the proposal. So it's kind of weird that you have many post offices through critically needed this, uh, this part right here. It's in between two commas, so it shouldn't really be there. You want to avoid multiple commas unless it's a list, and we can see that it's clearly not a list. So the best way to combine it is B. Although postal banking is effective in other countries and many post offices are located in regions where banks are critically needed. That's the best choice. All right, 33. However, as Inspector General David C. Williams notes, U.S. post offices currently offer many similar products. So this is a sentence with a dependent and independent clause. So the dependent clause is the first part. Um, as Inspector General David C. Williams notes, and then the dependent clause is the rest, or the independent clause is the rest of it. However, there seems to be an, un an unnecessary comma right after Williams. So the best choice should have, it should maintain the comma after notes, but get rid of that one. So the best choice is D that has the right punctuation. Moving on to passage four. Costume Curators in the Digital Age Bridging art and popular culture, costume exhibits have enabled museums to attract media attention and new audiences. Such exhibits are created and overseen by costume curators. The term costume curators refers to professionals who oversee the acquisition, maintenance, and display of clothing collections at museums. Costume curators must have a deep knowledge of their collections and must study the materials, construction, and historical significance of the pieces. Also, they must share this knowledge with the public in accessible and entertaining ways. In recent years, some curators have used new technologies such as modeling software and digital displays to study and exhibit their collections. This has allowed curators to bring costumes to life in ways that were previously and formerly impossible. All right, so number 34, which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlined portion? So, We'll look at the sentences around 34. Such exhibits are created and overseen by costume curators. The term costume curators refers to professionals who oversee the acquisition, maintenance, and display of clothing collections at museums. Since costume curators is said here, um, it's probably not necessary to say, like, to say it again here. So what we want to do is try to find a way to um, put costume curators and this part together. And the best way to do that is D, if you just put a comma there. All the others have either um, the wrong type of punctuation or are too wordy. So for 34, the answer is D. All right, number 35. This has allowed curators to bring costumes to life in ways that were previously and formerly impossible. So since previously and formerly mean the same thing, you only need to have one of them. So like there are a lot of problems on the SAT like this. This is just focusing on uh, word redundancy. So the best choice is B previously, which just has one of the words, and all the others are too wordy. All right. One of the first costume exhibits to benefit from these technological developments was the 2014 Charles James Beyond Fashion Show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Early in their preparations, Met curators Harold Coda and Ian Glyer-Reader drew on new technologies to reach people who could not visit the exhibit in person. 
James, one of the most respected clothing designers of the 20th century, created sculptural dresses using many layers of unconventional materials. The curators used x-rays and computer models to study the layers of, fe of mesh, feathers, cotton, and horsehair that makes up James's cloverleaf gown, which would be one of the centerpieces of their show. Having come to a fuller understanding of James's work, how to present it in the best way to museum visitors was what the curators had to determine. Number 36. Um, one of the first costume exhibits to benefit from these technological developments. So from seems to make sense um, if you try all the other ones. One of the first costume exhibits to benefit in, um, off of, or to just delete that, all of those are wrong. So the best choice is a no change. All right, number 37. Which choice best sets up the, the discussion of CODA and readers' work that follows in the paragraph? So uh, the following information talks about how the curators used x-rays and computer models to study the complex layers of James's cloverleaf gown. So this should be related to that. And the best choice is C, achieve a better understanding of James's clothing, because that's what they did with the computer models. They used them to um, just understand his complicated dresses better. Number 38, the curators used x-rays and computer models to study the layers of mesh, feathers, cotton, and horsehair that makes up James's cloverleaf gown. So since the noun that this verb is referring to, um, the subject is layers instead of just layer. So if it was singular, then makes would be fine. But since layers is plural, then um, 38, it should be make up instead of makes. So the best choice is B for 38. All right, 39. Having come to a fuller understanding of James's work, how to present it in the best way to museum visitors was what the curators had to determine. So we want to maintain active voice. So the best choice to um, put this in an active voice, I guess, is C. The curators had to determine the best way to present it to museum visitors. All the other choices have passive voice or are just not correct. Yeah, they're too, um, I guess, too wordy. James's dresses presented the curators with one of their most common professional challenges, marking the exhibit, marketing the exhibit to increase museum admissions. Clothing in museums would quickly fall apart if it were handled frequently, but traditional displays of costumes on mannequins make it difficult for visitors to see how a piece is constructed. Coda and Reader solved this dilemma by designing computer animations that showed visitors the separate pieces that make up dresses such as the cloverleaf gown, the way these pieces fit together, and the ways the finished dresses fit when they're worn. By doing so, the curators could give museum goers a sense of their own excitement at being able to see inside James's designs. Number 40, which choice best introduces the discussion that follows in the paragraph? So the discussion that follows in the paragraph is talking about how um, if you allow visit if you allow like visitors to handle dresses, um, the dresses could be fragile and could break if you allow them to handle it. However, if you just display it on a mannequin, then they won't be able to see the layers of the dress. So the best, um, I guess, introduction to that topic is D, displaying fragile pieces to the public, because that's the challenge that the costume curators have to deal with. Number 41. Traditional displays of costumes on mannequins make it difficult for visitors to see how a piece is constructed. Um, so A, no change is the best choice, because the words are correct there. For B, um, is and A are out of order, and then C and D are wrong because they're questions, which they shouldn't be. Number 42. At this point, the writer's considering adding the following sentence. Also featured in the show was James's taxi wrap dress, which stands in contrast to the cloverleaf gown due to its simple design and the ease with which it can be, with which it can be put on. Should the writer make this addition here? So this whole paragraph, or the whole passage is talking about how the curators used um, computer modeling to study uh, the cloverleaf gown, which is a pretty complicated layered dress. And computer modeling was really the best way to balance the risk of having it, uh, you know, damaged by people touching it and the problem with, you know, no one being able to see how the dress is made. So to um, include information about like this other dress that's not mentioned anywhere else, it shouldn't be added and it's not related to the paragraph. So D is the correct choice. According to Valerie Steele, chief curator of the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology, 
A costume curator's job is to tell the story of the meaning of the clothes. New technologies have allowed costume curators to tell their stories in more compelling ways, and other exhibit teams at the Met would do well to imitate the costume curator's approach. So the best choice for 43, um, the comma after two is unnecessary. So um, that shouldn't be there. And if you look at the other choices, um, the punctuation shouldn't be where it is. So like a semicolon is wrong there and the, the colon or the comma in C is wrong too. So the best choice for 43 is D. Um, generally, if you're dealing with quotes, if you remove the quotes and it can still make sense as a sentence, then you don't need a comma before. All right, number 44. The writer wants a conclusion that supports the main discussion of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So the whole passage is talking about how they use technology during or for the Charles James exhibit. So the best choice is C. Um, new technologies have allowed costume curators to tell their stories in more compelling ways, making clothing exhibitions such as Charles James, Beyond Fashion, some of the most popular and exciting museum shows in, in recent memory. This is going to be section number three, which is the math no calculator section. Okay, number one. In the equation above, A is a constant for which the following values of A will the equation of no solution. So in this case, it's just going to be very simple. It's just going to be zero because in this because if it's zero x, any whatever x is going to be, the answer will have to be zero because anything comes zero is zero. But because the, the answer is going to be five, zero does not work, which means it has no solution. Okay, number two. If three times three x plus five is equal to two x minus eight, what is the value of x? In this case, I'm going to distribute and then solve for x. So it's pretty simple. 9x plus 15 is equal to 2x minus 8. And then if we just do this properly, it's going to be 7x is equal to negative 23. And then x is equal to negative 23 over 7a. Number 3, for the linear function h, the table above shows several values of x and their corresponding values of h of x, which are the following defines h. In this case, it's just going to be which of the following equations represents this table. So I see for every two value jump in x, it's a six value jump in, of, in the y value or, a or, or the h of x value. So that's a six over two value, which is equal to three. So that's a slope of three. And then so, so the only one has a slope of three is b. So yeah. Terence's car contains eight gallons of fuel. He plans to drive the car m miles using the fuel currently in the car. If the car can drive 20 miles per gallon of fuel, which inequality gives the best possible values of m? So there's eight gallons of fuel and 20 miles per gallon. That gives me how many miles of tank of in his tank he has. So that's eight times 20. And he can only drive however many miles he has on his on his in his car, right? So that means m is going to have to be less than or equal to. So a is the right answer. In the figure above, line T intersects lines L and K, which are the following statements, if true, would imply that lines L and K are parallel. So if you have two parallel lines and you have, a, you have a line intersect them, these two angles are the same, as well as this angle, and this angle, and this angle, and this angle. That's just a property of how, how it works. So in this case, W would be the same as Z, and it's saying if these two lines are parallel, and that's one of the, that's one of the things, W equals Z, I thought B is the answer there. And also another thing is here they put W equal to Y, which is technically true, but all it does is tell us about line L. So that's why A cannot be right answer. So C is just blatantly wrong because it's X is equal to Z. However, there's no property saying that X is equal to Z. And in fact, at X, 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 X plus Z is equal to 180, which means X and Z are supplemental angles. And D is also true. X plus Y does equal to 180 because they're supplemental angles. However, it, all it does is tell us about line L. It doesn't tell us anything about line L and K, which means the pillow. So why, that's why B is the right answer there. Okay, number six, blood volume VA, sorry, VB in the human can be determined by using the equation VB equals VP over one or minus H, where VP is the plasma volume and H is the hematocrit. I don't think it's pronouncing that right, but it's whatever, the fraction of blood volume that is red blood cells, which of the following correctly expresses the hematocrit in the terms of the blood volume and the plasma volume. This is just making H equal to the rest of all the other variables. 
in this case, it would be out, out first use out and multiply what is by one minus h and divide what is by one v over b. So basically, it's the same thing as just replacing this by this. It's gonna be one minus h equal to vp over vb. And then, all, and then afterwards, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add h to this side and subtract this from this side. You could you could just subtract one and then just multiply both of that negative one, but I find it easy just always to deal with positives. So I'm gonna get one minus VP over VB equals H. So that's the answer. A is the right answer for number six. Number seven, what is the solution to the equation above? In this case, I see that two of these denominators have X plus five, so I wanna make this one to X, over X minus X plus five too. So this is gonna be one minus, that's gonna be X plus five over x plus five minus one over x plus five. So this gives me two x plus two. I just distributed that top one over x plus five. It's equal to x plus four over x plus five. This means two x plus two is equal to x plus four. Now if I solve for x properly, I get x is equal to two, b. Number eight, which of the following is the solution to the equation above? Two x squared minus two equals two x plus three. This case is just 2x squared minus 2x minus 5 equal to 0. Use the quadratic formula, which is negative b, which is 2, plus or minus square root of b squared, so 4 minus, or it's going to be positive because it is negative 5, but it's, it's minus 4ac, but four, negative 4 times negative 5 is 20, plus 2, so it's going to be plus, plus 40 over 2. Uh, two, four, it's two a. This can be two plus or minus square, two times square root 11, because it's four, I, I just took out the four. Over four, this gives me one plus or minus square root 11 over two, and that's D, because it, it, it can be one plus square root 11 over two, or one minus square root 11 over two. In this case, it's one plus square root of 11 over two. At least, at least that's, the one, that's, the, that's the one in the answer choices. Okay, number nine, which of the following is not a factor to polynomial above. In this case, I know X is already is gonna be a factor because I can see this X on everything. So if I factor that out, I get two X squared plus 11 X plus five. And obviously X is one of the factors, so I just took it out because I wanna know what the other two factors are. In this case, I, I, I think if I wanna find two factors, I'm assuming that if, that if, it's, if it's, it's gonna be pretty simple to find two factors because all these numbers are pretty simple. So I think to myself, let me just try doing factoring by grouping. So how that works is I first do two times five, that'll give me 10. And then I, and I try to find two numbers that add up to 11 and multiply to 10. This is sort of similar to the normal factoring, but in this case, we, we had to do something different because the coefficient is greater than one here. So that's, I, I see it's 10 plus one, but in this case, I'm gonna do one plus 10, I'll explain it later, plus x plus 10x plus five. So in this case, what I did was, now now I, I, I separate these two and I factor it out separately. So I get, not really separate, but like, like, like for terms of factoring, I separate them. So this gives me two X over X, sorry, not two X. Normal X plus times two X plus one plus five times two X plus one. I factor out a five from this side and two from, and X from the other side. And so the reason I did x plus 10x instead of 10x plus x is because I knew in advance that I, I, I want these two to be together and 10x plus five together because I can, I can factor them in common from them. So you, you just want to group like, usually, like things that look similar in your brain. Usually it's gonna be the right answer. If, it's, if you get something weird, try the other way around. So I would move x here and see if I can factor something else different here from here. And then now for me, I do x plus five. So I, I do this times plus this times two x plus one. And I just factor this. So now I know these two are factors, and x is also a factor, obviously. So x, it can be x, it can be x plus five, and it can be x, two x plus two, one, so it has to be two x plus five, d. Number 10, the graph in the xy plane of the linear function f contains the point three comma four. For every increase of five units in x, f of x increases by three units, which of the following equations defines the function. So in this case, I'm just going to do, every increase of five, it's increased by two, so that means, it's, it's increase in y over increase in five, so it's gonna be three over five. And it's gonna be positive because both are increases. So that's why here the answer choice has to be C.
Okay, number 11. So I see. I don't know why I didn't circle it. Number 11. The table above gives selected values of a polynomial function P based on the values in the table, which of the following must be a factor of P. So if for something to be a factor, again, remember it has to be something like X minus H, where H is going to be the X, it's H is going to be the X value and Y equals zero, so it's going to be an intercept. So what's the X value for when Y equals zero? We have two right here. So it's going to be X plus one because X minus negative one. And also it's also going to be X minus two. So the only one that shows that is D. Okay, number 12. The function g is defined by the equation above, which are the following points in the xy plane. It's the x is an x intercept of the graph of the equation y equals g times x. Well, in this case, I'm basically just going to find an x intercept. So that's basically when y equals 0. That means 0 equals 2x minus 2. 2x equals 2. So that means x has to equal 1. So that means it's going to be 1 comma g of 1. And g of 1 is just going to be 0. So C is the right answer for 12. <clears throat> Number 13, which of the following is a graph of the, in the xy plane of the given equation? So I know that it has, to, I know that the, I can tell from here it's gonna be a negative facing slope because it's a negative x squared. So A and C can already be eliminated. And I know that the y intercept has to equal, has to be zero comma zero because there's no constant. So if I plug in zero for x, I'm gonna get y equals zero. So here the y-intercept is 4, so it can't be b, it has to be d. Okay, number 14. In the complex number system, what is the value of the given expression? So i squared is just ne root negative 1 squared, which is a negative 1. And negative, a negative i is times a negative i squared is the same as i squared. So i plus a negative 1, so minus 1, that's negative 2. 14 is a. We're going to 15, the last question in the multiple choice. The dimensions of a re right rectangular prism are 4 inches by 5 inches by 6 inches. So if I were to draw it, which I'm a pretty bad drawer, so don't judge. It would be something like 4, 5, 6. Obviously, I didn't draw it to scale, but whatever. Yeah, so in this case, if I want to find square, if I want surface area, the easy way to do it is to do this times this. So 2 times. 4 times 5, which is 20, plus, because there's, there's two sides of this, right, on the top and the bottom, times, plus, sorry, plus 2 times 4 plus times 6, which is 24, plus 2 times 5, five times 6, which is 30. So this is just going to be, so if I add all this together, it's a pretty simple addition, you would hopefully get 148. So 15 is D. So now the more answer number 16. If x comma y is the solution to the given system of equations, what is the value of y? So if x equals 2, so that means 3 times 2, which is 6, plus y is equal to 29. Y is equal to 23. That's the right answer. 17, a pizza parlor sells pizza slices for $3 each and calzones for $4 each. A group of friends spends $51 on pizza slices and calzones at the parlor. If they bought fit six calzones, how many pizza slices did they buy? So they bought six calzones for four dollars each. That's twenty-four dollars. But they said they spent fifty-one dollars. So if I subtract these two, I get twenty-seven. But there's three pizza pizza slices are three dollars each. So they spent twenty-seven dollars on pizza slices. That means they bought nine pizza slices. I just divide twenty-seven by three. If you don't, if you, if you didn't realize that. Okay, number eighteen. If a resistance is ignored, the function h is defined above. Defined above models the height above ground and feet of a toy rocket t seconds after it is launched from the roof of a building. Based on the model, what is the height above ground and feet of the toy rocket one second after launch? So that's t equals 1. Just put negative 16 times 1 squared is just 1 plus 48 times 1 plus 72. And if you do your addition right, you should get the answer 104. In these cases, if you're doing the addition in your head, just try to ch just. I would suggest doing it in your, doing it on paper. It takes like a couple seconds extra, and if you're not really, and if you do some of the other trick, like 
easier tricks usually like on the, on the other questions usually you haven't more than enough time to just do it by hand because it is always better to make sometimes your, your brain can just be like screwed up because you already taken two long sections before this so always just try to write it out on paper instead of doing stuff on your head the points plotted in the coordinate plane above represents the possible numbers of wallflowers and cornflowers someone can buy in the garden got at the garden the store in order to spend exactly $24 total on the two types of flowers. The price of each wallflower is the same and the price of each cornflower is the same. What is the price in dollars of one cornflower? So what I would first do here is I realized that they gave me an intercept right here. Six, that means, that means, so that means zero wallflowers and 16 cornflowers is equal to $24. So that means I, I can do 16, let's say cornflowers is X. Exactly, the price of one cornflower is X is equal to 24. X is equal to 24 over 16, which is equal to 3 over 2. I just simplified it because I know both top 24 and 16 can be divided by 8. If this, if the square root of X, 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 X to the fifth power over the cube root of X to the fourth power equals X times A over, A over B, X to the power of A over B, for all positive values of X, what is the value of A over B? So in this case, I would make everything in the fraction form, x to 5 over 2 over x to 4 over 3 power. Here, you know, I just do 5, the numerator fraction is going to be whatever this value is, and the denominator is whatever root it is. So in this case, the square, the square root is 2, in this case, it's 3 and 4, so 4 over 3. And if I'm dividing, if I'm dividing the ones that have the same, like, the main value, but different fractions, for the exponents, I just subtract them. So I have x, x to the power of 5 over 2 minus 4 over 3 is equal to x a over b. So that means a over b is equal to 5 over 2 minus 4 over 3, which is simply 7 over 6. And that's it for section 3. This is going to be section number four. Number one, a care sharing service charges six dollars per hour to rent a car plus a ten dollar fee for insurance. So that's the the what's it called slope, and the ten dollars is going to be your your intercept value, so your b value in the mx plus b form, which is following gives the total cost in dollars for a rental that lasts t hours. So again, it's going to be six t plus ten, which gives me a. Okay, number two. If y equals x squared plus ax plus a, where a is a constant, and y equals 11, and when x equals 1, what is the value of a? Just plug in 1 and 11. So 11 equals 1 squared plus a plus a. So that's 2a equals 10. a equals 5. 2 is d. Now we have 3 and 5 on this one like chart thingy. This kind of problem above represents the height length. Head lengths in centimeters uh, and body lengths in centimeters of 14 adult crocodiles. The, link, the line of best fit for the data is also shown. The box plot also summarizes the body length, of, the body lengths of the 14 crocodiles. For an adult crocodile with a head length of 30 centimeters, which is the following closest to the body length in centimeters protected by the line of best fit. So 30 centimeters right here. That's around here. That's less than 250, but it's over 200. So 215 it is. 3 is B. Number four, based on the line of best fit of the following, which is the best estimate of the increase in predicted body length in centimeters for every 10 centimeter increase in head length. So for every 10, that's basically from here to here. Or like, yeah, so if we did the math, it would be like around here to around here. That's basically around three fourths of the way there. So 75, that seems accurate. So B is the right answer then. Number five, based on the box plot of the following, which is the best estimate of the median body, body length in centimeters of the 14 crocodiles. If you don't know, in a box plot, the median is this line in between the boxes right here. And this line is the, me is the median between th this, this half of the data. And this line is the median between the, this bottom half of the data. And this line is the highest data point. This is the lowest data point. So yeah, but we want the overall median. So that's this point right here. So that's, so that's higher than 300, but less than 350. So I would say 320. So C is the right answer for number five. 
Number six, if 5x minus 7 equals 13, what is the value of 10x minus 14? Here, just multiply both sides by 10, divide by, by 2, and you get 10x minus 14 equals 26. Instead of solving for x, if you just do, if you just realize you can just multiply both sides by 2, you save some time, which and all time is valuable on the SAT because it gives you more time to go back and check your answers. Number seven in the table above, the ratio of y to x for each ordered pair is constant. What is the value of k? So as you can see, x is one while y is four, so that means it's a four to one ratio. So if x is 40, that means it's gonna be four times 40, which is 160, d. Number eight, which of the following expressions is equivalent to two a squared times a plus three? That's two a cubed plus six a squared, that's d. So far, you can see that most of these are pretty simple. That's because, as I've said multiple times, the earlier questions are the easier questions, while as you progress to the test, it gets harder. So if you're stuck on an earlier question, you may want to think back. And usually, there's obviously, there's always like exceptions. Like some, sometimes the middle question will be the hardest question on the test. However, if you see like a really early question that you're having trouble on, maybe think, try to calm, like, like relax your mind and try to think, especially if you're missing something or anything, that can really help you if, if you're stuck on a question, in the, one of the early questions. Yeah, but number nine, the graph above shows a temperature in a room during a day when the thermostat malfunction, but which of the following two hour periods was the difference in the maximum and minimum temperatures the greatest? So you basically want to know what's the greatest peak. So one to three, that's that's basically the same, like it's not that big of a it's not that big of a peak or like a difference. Three to five is the next. That's this is pretty steep. The next is five to seven. This is this is pretty steep too, but it's not as steep if you look at it because it goes like this is like sort of like that, while this is more like obviously I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but like the, the three to five is slightly more steeper than the five to than the five to seven, and the other one is seven to nine. That's this one here. This is also not as steep as the other one, so that's why B is the right answer. Number 10, if the population of snow leopards in a certain area can be modeled by the function p defined above of p of, p of t is the population, where p of t is the population t years after 1990, of the following, which is the best interpretation of the equation p, p of 30 equals 550. So p of 30 basically means where t is equal to 30, and, and this, this value is equal to 550. So if we know that p of t is the population t years after 1990, so if it's 30 years afterwards, that means it's going to be 2020, and it's going to be population is going to be 550. So the only one that fits there is answer choice C. Number 11, in the x y plane, which are the following changes to, to the graph of the equation y equals x, x squared plus 3 will result in the equation y equals x squared plus 3 minus 6. So if you have a minus 6 here outside of the x value, then that's a upwards or downwards. But since it's a negative number, it's downwards 6. So D is the right answer for number 11. Number 12, Tanya earns $13.50 per hour at her part-time job where she works Z hours. She earns $13.50 $13 Z times Z dollars. Which of the following expressions gives the amount of dollars Tanya will earn if she works three Z hours? So that's three Z times this. So that's basically A. And these are pretty simple comparatively. Like study so far. 13, there was a typo on the actual exam, on like the exam we gave you, the PDF we gave you. Here, the last column here was two. However, it was supposed to be three. So you guys may have noticed that the answer you guys got may have been like one off on both the top and bottom than the actual answer. That's probably why. If it was, it was a typo, we apologize for that. There's two other typos later on the exam, on this section. So again, we apologize for that. Okay, yeah. So number 13, the table above gives the number of United States presidents from 1789 to 2015, whose age at the time they first took office is within the interval listed. Of those presidents who were at, at least 50 years old when they first took office, what fraction were at least 60 years old? So you know, at, at least 50 years old, that's all these numbers. So 13 plus 11 plus 7 plus 3, that's going to be your, your denominator. And your and your numerator is going to be, <coughs> sorry, your numerator is going to be at least sixty, so that's seven plus three, and that's going to be ten over 
34. B is your right answer for number 13. Number 14, which of the following graphs in the x-y plane could be used to solve the system of equations above? So I, I, I first would look at this first equation. I would put in the y equals mx b form. That, that gives me 5y, e, sorry, that gives me y equals negative 1 over 5x plus 5. So I see it starts <clears throat> probably plus 1, my mistake. And the bottom one would just be y equals 2x plus 4. Yeah, so uh, what I can see is that 1 9 is going to be negative 1 half, 1 fifth x plus 1. So it starts at 1 and it goes down at, a, like a, at, at the lower steep. The only one that works so for that one is c. However, just to make sure the other line, 2x plus 4, is, that means it goes up at a high rate, but it, it is going to be a 2 plus 4, a 4, my mistake. And that's, that also fits for C. This one's also pretty simple. 15, in the figure above, AF, BE, and CD are parallel. Point B and E lie on AC and FD respectively. If AB equals 9, BC equals 18.5, and FE equals 8.5, what's the length of ED? That's this length right here. To the nearest tenth. So in this case, since we know it's parallel, I, I'm, I'm thinking my brain, this part and, and I see like diagonal lines from the parallel lines. I'm thinking it may be something to do with angles. So I, I check it out. I see which angles are equal to each other. So first, this is this angle, and this angle is actually going to be equal since this line and this line are all equal. It's going to be equal to this this angle, and this angle over here is going to be equal to this angle because uh, th these two are parallel lines and corresponding angles, and this angle is going to be equal to this angle as you can probably guess. And finally, this angle is going to be equal to whatever. I already added, yeah. It's going to be equal to this angle. So since all four angles do line up, what we know is, sorry. Let me see write this. So what we know is, is that th th this trapezoid here, that I call trapezoid one, is similar to trapezoid two. So that means that the side lengths are proportional. So obviously this angle over this, so this angle over this angle is going to be the same as this angle over this angle. So let's put that into fraction form. 8.5 over 9 is going to equal x over 18.5. Now I just plug into my calculator. 8.5 divided by 9 times 18.5. And I get an answer. It's like 17.47, which is 17.5 rounded. So the answer choice for 15 is B. So basically, a lot of this is on the SAT is just thinking, what based on the information they gave us, if I'm stuck on a question, just try to see what, what methods I could use to solve for that equation. Okay, number seven, 16 and 17. So we have this data table here of all juniors and seniors who attended a particular high school during the 2014 to 2015 school year, 149 participated in the clubs listed in the table above. Each of the 149 students participated in only one of the four clubs, school clubs listed. The table shows the distribution of the 149 students by class and club participation. So 16, the band was composed of, fresh, of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. If 30% of the students in the band were juniors, what, how many students were in the band? So if, so we have 21, sorry, we have, 18 students that are juniors in the band. So 18 is equal to 0 0.3, 30% of X, which is the top value. So I just do 18 divided by 0 0.3, plug that into my calculator, and you get 60. So D is the right answer for 16. And for 17, of the number of students, juniors and seniors in the drama club, the 25% who walked to school represent one eighth of the total number of juniors and seniors who walked to school. How many juniors and seniors walked to school? So what it basically means is of, of the number of juniors and seniors in the drama club, so that's this total number 48. So we have 48 students and 25% walked to school. So 0.25. So if I do that, that's 48 times 0.25. That's 12. And this 12 is one eighth of the total number of juniors and seniors who walk to school. So if I want to know the total number, I would just do times eight to get a total number. So 12 times eight, if you know how, if you know your multiplication tables, is 96. So 17 is A. 
Moving on to number 18, a bag containing 10,000 beads of assorted colors is purchased from a craft store to estimate the percent of red beans in the bag. A sample of beads is selected at random. The percent of red beans in the bag was estimated to be 15% with an associated margin of error of 2%. If R is the actual number of red beads in the bag, which of the following is most plausible? So in this case, I, I see there's 10,000 beads. So and so 15% is red. So that so I'll do 15% of 10,000. And you you can do this in your mind, but I would it's pretty it's pretty easy to do in your mind. But just in case, always just do it in your calculator. Like I like your calculator. You, like you, the chance that you misclick on your calculator is less than the chance that you screw something up that you mentally math. So yeah, so this is gonna be 1500. Sorry, I don't know why I wrote 1800 there. 1500. And but the margin of error is two percent. So what that means is going to be ninety times point nine eight, which is fourteen seventy. <coughs> Sorry, a margin of error of two percent. My bad. So two percent of the total one thousand ten thousand beads is going to be two hundred. So if if I have this fifteen hundred right here, and when I take two, so I'm just going to be between thirteen hundred and seventeen hundred because it's because we don't know within that margin of error what it is. So yeah, that's basically that. If 18, so that's why B is the right answer there because it's within, within that range of margin of error. And the fact that this is most plausible is good because you do not want an absolute. If it's an absolute statement, then it's kind of difficult because all your data can always be wrong because it's, it's an estimation. Okay, number 19. For the linear function f, the table above gives some values of x and the corresponding values f of x, where c is a constant. Which of the following equations defines f? So I see from here that at zero it's C. So I know it's gonna be C and I know it's in linear because it goes up by one C every time. So it starts off at C and goes up by C every time. So it's gonna be CX plus C, that's C. A lot of C's there. 20, if X is a solution to the given equation, which of the following is a possible value of one X plus five. So I see this and I, I wanna put this equation on the line. So I'm gonna pick the reciprocal of both sides, which I can do. It's gonna become X squared plus 10 X plus 25 equals one over four. And now I can factor this out to be X plus five squared equals one over four. And then this, and then I take square root of both sides. So that's X plus five equals one half. A is the right answer for 20. 21, the graph of a line in the xy plane has a positive slope and intersects, sorry, and intersects the y-axis at a point that has a negative y-coordinate, which of the following could be the equation to the line. So it has a positive slope and intersects at a negative x-y-coordinate. So I'm gonna put all this, so if I, I can already tell from here it's gonna be y is equal to three over two x, minus phi over two. So that's a negative y, y coordinate and a positive slope. So, so so A is the right answer for 21. However, if you check the other ones, you will see it doesn't work. Like in this case, it's gonna be a positive slope, but also a positive y intercept. In the second case, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a negative x slope. So that doesn't work. And in the third case, it's gonna be, a, it's also gonna be a negative slope. And it's gonna be a negative slope and a positive y coordinate. So it's, it's wrong on both sides. And two wrongs do not make a right. Okay, so 21 is A. 22, the revenue f of x and dollars that a company receives from the sales of a product is given by the function f above, where x is the unit price in dollars of the product. The graph of y equals f of x in the xy plane intersects the x axis at zero, 0 and A. What does A represent? So, so we want to know what A, so, we, so, it's, so A is basically one of the x, the x intercepts. So the revenue, so is it A, the revenue in dollars where when the unit price of the product is zero. So the unit price is is gonna be, the unit price is gonna be X. So it's not gonna be when the unit price is zero because it's that's the Y intercept. So A is wrong. The unit price in dollars of the product that, that result in maximum revenue, that's the, that's gonna be the, what's it called, the vertex. So that's B is wrong. The unit price in dollars of the product that will result in um, in a revenue of zero dollars. That's correct because the revenue of zero dollars that's a y value of zero, and the unit price is the x value. So that's that's a that's a so so yeah. So that's going to be the x x intercept. And d the maximum revenue in dollars that the company can make 
that's going to be the y point of the vertex. So that's also wrong. Twenty-three. The graph, the graph of the equation ax plus ky equals negative six is a line in the xy plane where a and k are constants. If the line contains the point negative two comma negative six and zero comma negative three, what is the value of k? I don't even care about this point because I have this point, which is a golden point. I want to know what k is because it's because that, because that this eliminates the ax because the it's x is equal to zero. So this just becomes k times negative three equals six. K equals negative two. So 23 is A. That's why you, you, you should always see which point you can use to make your life easier. So it, in this case, if this point wasn't as easy, you would have to use system of equations and solve that way. 25, 24 minus six. From 2005 to 2014, the number of music CDs sold in the United States declined each year by approximately 15% of the numbers sold the, pre the preceding year. In 2005, approximately 6 million CDs were sold. That's the initial value, so that goes here. And it's a decrease of 15%, so 0.85 times T. So of the following, which are best models? So it's going to be, as I said, it's going to be this. So it's going to be B, 24. And if you want to know this format, basically, if it's an exponential increase or decrease, what it is is it's the initial value. So let's call that A. It's the initial value times whatever the interest rate, whatever like the increase or decreases. So, so in this case, if it's an increase of 15%, it would be 1.15. But in this case, if it's a decrease in 15%, it's gonna be 0 0.85. And to the x power or t in this case, because t is the independent, independent variable. So yeah, that's like the format of how it works. So I use, I, I use that format to, fi to find this, the, the line, or like the equation of the line. Okay, now we're on 25. G of t equals negative 0 0.34 times t times minus 5.51 squared it plus 8.26. The function g above models the growth rate of a certain plant in millimeters per day in terms of the watering time in minutes per day. What is the meaning of 5.51 comma g times 5.51 in this context? So g times 5.51 is basically the solution to this. So in this case, you want to know what the meaning of 5.51 is. So that means the so the what so a the watering time of 5.51 minutes per day results in a plant growth rate of g comma g of 5.51 millimeters per day. <clears throat> so this seems correct so far because I, the watering time is 5.51 minutes per day, which is the x value and because the watering time is the x value and plant growth rate is the g of t value and that's the g of things. So, so far, this seems like the right answer. Let me check the other ones. We'll see if the other ones are wrong. The plant growth rate of 5.51 of 5 millimeters per day results in a watering time of g of 5.51 mil minutes per day. This is wrong because it's the opposite where it's saying that the plant growth rate is the x value. However, if you read a question, you know that's not the x value. C, the watering time increases by G of 5.51 minutes per day to every 5.51 day increase in growth rate. That doesn't really work because that's not how it works. And D, the growth rate increases by G of 5.51 millimeters per day for every 5.51 minute increase. It's not, it's, I guess we all said it's not going to increase because if it's G of 5.51, that's basically that solution. So it's at 25, it's A. 26, a psychologist designed and conducted a study to determine whether playing a certain educational game increases middle school students' accuracy in adding fractions. For the study, the psychologist chose a random sample, so that's so far good, of all the students at one of the middle schools in a large city. The psychologist found that the students who played the game showed significant improvement in accuracy when adding fractions. What is the logic group to which the results of the study can be generalized? The 35 students in the sample, yes, it can be generalized. So that's so far, that's the largest. All the students at the school? Yes, because it's, it's, they randomly select these students from the school. So it's supposed to be able to represent the larger population at the school. So, so far, so we know A is wrong because B, so while A and B are both work, B is the larger, is the larger group. So that's why so far B is the right answer. So I don't know. Right answer. And C, all middle school students in the city. You may think this could, this could work. However, the problem is it's, 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 it's one of the middle schools in a large city. And like, if you ever been to a large city, like if you think of San Francisco or New York, different parts of the city have like different parts, right? Like, like 
the city the city isn't like this like isn't like the same thing it's in the same all across the city like there's different factors that contribute to different like populations in the school like one school may be like full of rich kids one another school may be like not so much so yeah so like, it, it determines like it, you, you don't really know it's like you can't you can't really t- like generalize one like one res- set of results to the whole city because the city because the city has different like the, like the city has different factors within itself I hope that made sense. That's why C that can't work, and all students in the city doesn't work because this is just for middle school students. That's why B is the right answer. Twenty-seven. A manufacturer determined that right that right cylindrical containers with a height that is four inches longer than a radius offer the optimal number of containers to be displayed on the shelf, which is the following expresses the volume V in cubic inches of such containers where X is, where R is the radius in inches. So in this case, what's the a volume of a of a of a cylindrical container is basically going to be H times pi R squared. But if H is equal to four plus R times pi r squared this becomes v is equal to 4 pi r squared plus pi r cubed and that's basically d which you just flip around these two terms which you can do because it's addition okay number 28 for the function f if f of 3 of x equals x minus 6 for all values of x what is the value of f f of 6 so that what that basically means is f of six has to equal f of three times two because three times two equals six. So if I want to make this equal to each, so that, that would mean that it's two minus six, which is negative four, b is the right answer. 29, this, this one also had a mistake in it because in this, like on, on the printed version we gave you, there's six here. This is not supposed to be a six. It's supposed to be C. In the system below, A and C are constant. If the system of equations has infinite number of solutions, x comma y, what is the value of A? So in this case, if they have if they have infinite number of solutions, that means every single value is proportional. So one one half over A is going to be equal to let's say like A over one what's one one half is going to be equal to one over one third. That's because like that's because like this is like this like the, this coefficient over this coefficient is the same as this over this coefficient like that that's how infinite solutions work so all the coefficients have to be proportional to each other so i just solve for a like this this will be a is equal to one over one third is just three times one half which is going to be <clears throat> a is equal to three over two d is the right answer with 29. Okay, number 30, a researcher surveyed 200 adults selected at random from the city of Adelaide and 300 adults selected at random from the suburbs of Adelaide. Each person surveyed was asked whether he or she owns a car. Some of the results are shown in the particular, in the partially completed table below. The researcher found that an adult surveyed in the suburbs of Adelaide is twice as likely to own a car as an adult surveyed in the city of Adelaide. Of the following, which, are default, which could be the value of X? So we know. So if if you in the suburbs, they're twice as likely to own a car. We first want to know how likely they are to own a car in the city, so we can translate that to the suburbs. So in the city, it's eighty over two hundred, which is the same as, <clears throat> which is the same as forty over two hundred, which is basically a uh, a forty over one hundred, which means it's a forty percent. They're forty percent likely. But if you if you're twice as likely to do that, means it, that means you they're eighty percent likely in the suburbs to own a car. So I would do 0. 0.80 times 300 because that's how many people are in this. They serve in the suburbs. So 0. 0.8 times 300 and put in a calculator, and you get 240, which is your D value, which is D. So that so that's how you 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 solve for x in that scenario. Okay, number 31. This is the gridden, obviously. Pure beeswax has a density of 0. 0.555 ounce per cubic inch. An online company sells pure beeswax at a price of eight dollars per ounce. What is the selling price in dollars per cubic inch for pure beeswax purchased from this company? So if it's eight dollars per ounce and it has density of 0.555 ounce, you just multiply those two, and if you multiply properly, you can answer 4.44 dollars per cubic inch. So your answer is 4.44. 
the mean of this list is of numbers below above is the fra is the what fraction of the sum of the fine numbers. Obviously, you would just f find the sum, then you then you find the mean, and you just do it that way. However, you just think rationally here. The, you, what, how would you solve the mean in this scenario? You would add all of these, so it's called the sum x. You would add all of these and divide by five, so that, that's how you find the mean, and you get the sum. So that means that the, fra the that means that the the mean is one fifth of the sum, right? Because to find the mean, you do you take you divide the sum by five. So so you can just simply know, so you can just like mentally know that it's going to be one fifth. Thirty three. The equation x plus six squared plus y plus three squared equals one twenty one defines the circle in the xy plane. What is the radius of the circle? If you don't know, the equation of a circle is basically x minus h squared x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared where r is radius and h comma k is the center. So in this case, if r squared is 121, the radius is 11. 34, a baker's gathering the ingredients required to make 13, 15 batches of oatmeal cookies and one cake. The cake will require one quarter bag of flour. The baker needs a total of more than three, but less than four bags of flour. What is one possible value for the fraction of one bag of flour required for each batch of cookies? So the bake, So in, my, in this case, since I know a cake will require one quarter bag of flour, I'll just do three and one fourth because it's more than three and less than four. There are multiple solutions, but I'm just trying to find the easiest one I know of. So if I do three and one fourth, that means there's three bags left of four. <coughs> that means there's three bags left for the for the batch of cookies. So the three bags over fifteen gives me one over five, which fits in the range of answers that was acceptable. So again, what I did was I, if I I just picked any number I wanted, I just picked three point two five because I know one quarter bag is one cake, so I just found that number to be the easiest one to use. Yeah, moving on, number thirty-five. The the histogram. This is the histogram summarizes the distribution of data set composed of 50 integers. The first bar represents the number of integers that are less that are, le that are at least 10 but less than 5. The second bar represents the number of integers that are at least 5 but, le but less than 10, and so on. What is the possible value for this for, of the medians of the data set? So you want to find median, what you first do is if it's, you take the number, which is 50, the total number, and you divide by 2, which is 25. And in this case, it would, it would, be, it would, be, <coughs> it would be 24 to tw and, and 25. like. That's like the range. Sorry, 25 to 26, my mistake. So that's like your range of what's like, how to explain this. Like, I, that's like the number you want. I like, guess that's, that's what the median's gonna be. So what you would do is you would start from, the, you start from this and you keep going until you get to like 25 or 26. So, he, so here I have 12 here. So 12 plus nine, that's 21. That's not, I don't get it so far. But this, when I add this nine, I get to it. So that means the median is going to be on this on this bar, which is 10 to 15. So, but it, it has to be less than 15 because it, it's a, it's less less than five. So yeah, so it'd be less than 15. So so 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, any of those numbers would work. I just put 10. Number 36, in the equation above, the kinetic energy K of a 200 gram object is given in terms of its speed V. If the equation we written in the form V equals A square root of K, what, where a is a positive constant, what is the value of a? So I would just rewrite this as a thing. So first I would do both, multiply both sides by two. So that's 2k equals 200 v squared. Now I divide both sides by 200. So that gives me one, one over 100 k times equals v squared. Divide both sides by one, divide both square root both sides. Now the square root of one over 100 is just one tenth. So this would be one tenth k square root of k equals v. So that means a is equal to one tenth. So it's all 36. 37. Oh yeah, and this this one also did a mistake where this point over here that they, they it, it's marked as 420, but it's supposed to be 402, which is a mistake when it was when it, when, the, when, the, when it was rewritten. It was it was a mistake. It's supposed to be 402. The line graph above shows the population in thousands of people living in Alaska every 10 years since 1900 to 2000. What was the population of Alaska in thousands in 1990? That's pretty simple. 1990 is right here. That's 550. 38, the ratio of the population of Alaska in 1980 to the population of Alaska in 1970 can be written as A to 1, A over 1. What is the value of A? 
So I just want to find the ratio from 1980 to 1970. So that's going to be 402 over 300. Well, so that's like your ratio. And if you multiply that, if you like put in your calculator, you get a value of 1.34. So that means your ratio is going to be 1.34 to 1. Because you can simplify this fraction to 1.34 over 1. So, that, so your ratio A would equal 1.34.